Okay, Madam Chair, we're live. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So nice to see all of you. So nice to be here in, uh, in Harrisburg and in Dixon Center. Uh, welcome to everybody on Zoom, um, everybody watching us uh, in the public. Um, and this is our first meeting of 2022, which is sort of hard to believe. Um, not that it's the first meeting, but that it's 2022. Um, and why don't we uh, begin, let me just ask uh, for all board members who are on Zoom to please unmute your lines now so that we can make roll call easier. Um, I hope everybody had a really good uh, holiday break and are recharged for this new year. It's going to be uh, a very exciting one um, yeah. for Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education. Uh, and we have a lot of, I, I, I think, really exciting and interesting things to talk about. So let me first start by asking Charissa to do a roll call. Good morning. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you. Governor Bogle. He is on the Zoom. Representative Briggs. Here. Governor Gindelsberger. Here. Secretary Jones. <laughs> Senator Martin. Here. Governor Mazur? Here. Governor Moskowitz? Here. Secretary Ortega? Designee Tanya Garcia? Here. Representative Roy? Here. Governor Roberts? Here. Senator Schwank? Here. Governor Scott. Chair Shapira. Here. Governor Skinner. Here. Governor Smith. Here. Governor Walder. Here. Governor Weaver. Here. Governor Yeomans. Here. Faculty liaison, Jamie Phillips. We have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. May I please ask everybody in the room to rise uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a very full agenda today. Uh, before um, we, we get into that, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to welcome our newest member to the Board of Governors, who is Skylar Walder, um, joining us for her first meeting uh, as a student member of the Board of Governors. And she fills the seat vacated by Stephen Washington, who graduated in December. Skyler is an education major at SHIP and on the tennis team, um, has a very full plate. Um, you are only a sophomore, so we get the benefit uh, of your leadership and your insights uh, for several years, which is terrific. So welcome to the Board of Governors. We were so pleased you could join us yesterday for workshops. Um, and Skyler, I just want to give you an opportunity to say a few words. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I really appreciate the time and the opportunity to have this role, and um, I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you again. Uh, so th this is a very important meeting um, from the point of view, really, of the content uh, uh, and the topics we're going to be discussing, all of which are related, um, and uh, all of which sort of together put us uh, into the next phase of system redesign. Um, so just as a, as a preview, we're gonna get an update uh, on our board approved metrics, 
um, and uh, that we're gonna be able to follow along to see how uh, redesign is, is really progressing um, in, in terms of uh, the, the kinds of outcomes uh, that are important for us to be tracking. Um, and this, uh, we also are gonna review the, the use of the one-time funds that the state system is investing. Um, this is all related uh, to help um, students find pathways uh, to be successful at our Apache schools and for uh, our universities, of course, uh, to be able to provide uh, those pathways and those supports. Um, we're also going to have a discussion about our allocation formula. We are not taking an action on that today. Um, the development of the allocation formula is a process uh, that is taking place and uh, is a process that is going to give us ample time uh, to give feedback to the task force that is working on it. It's going to be iterative going back and forth. Um, and uh, I think by the time that we, we come to taking a, a board vote on a, approving that uh, in, in a couple of months, uh, there's gonna, there, there will have been a lot of thought and a lot of discussion that, that went into it. Um, as we'll see and talk about, approaching the allocation formula uh, is in a completely different way um, and it's one that is fitting in with this big buildup I'm making uh, to talking about this next stage um, of system redesign. So just if we you know, take a step back uh, very, very briefly, we have really been focused for the last few years um, on meeting the most uh, immediate and um, indeed, you know, possibly existential uh, issues with our system. Uh, starting with the review that we did of the system in 2016 to give us the foundation to move forward and say, okay, this is what we need to do to get our house in order. And that's what we've been focused on. Um, financial sustainability, uh, uh, accountability policies that this board adopted um, and that our universities have, have been responding to. Uh, tuition freezes since I believe 2018, and correct me if that's wrong, um, uh, the, the work that's done to lead up to university integrations, all of that um, was about a promise that we made um, to our students, uh, to our stakeholders, to the legislature, uh, to the governor, um, that, that we were gonna turn this system around. Um, and that's really what we've been focused on. And the only reason to do that uh, is because uh, we, care about uh, the Commonwealth, um, the people of the Commonwealth, and the, the, the students who are enrolled in our system. There's no other reason to have this system. We don't care about that. That's always been the bottom line. Um, and we're, we are pretty uh, comfortable in saying that now we're ready to move into a new phase of system redesign. And that phase is really focused on uh, I'm going to use a word that a phrase that I'm starting to dislike because it's uh, I'm overusing it. So I'm only <laughs> going to use it this once and then define it a little bit more. Um, but that is student success. And what that means to us is that we have an obligation with this system uh, to have it affordable and accessible. Um, and as many who can come into this system, uh, who can stay in the system, persist, who can graduate um, in, a, in a time period uh, that we would love to be four years, four to six years, which is sort of the, uh, I guess, the industry norm, and then into, um, into careers and into industries um, that are needed to build our Commonwealth and make sure that Pennsylvania is among the most competitive states in this country. So it's all there, it's all related. Uh, Pennsylvania's workforce needs, um, our role in it uh, as a PASHI system, as the only system that is owned by the state. Um, and therefore we need to be focused uh, on enrollment because uh, it's not only obviously the right thing to do and the obligation that we have to our students and to the legislature that supports us, but it's what the Commonwealth needs and it's all tied together. And that is the framework uh, that we meet, move into. 
in stage three of system redesign. Uh, what is our share and there, therefore what are all the different things that we need to do and the incentives that we need to put in place to ensure that Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education can meet its obligation to ensure um, the workforce and the competitiveness uh, of, 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 this, of this Commonwealth. Um, so it's a, a different way to look at things. It's in a way, it's not a different way to look at things. We've always cared about it, but it's really, I, I think, putting very firm, strong, concrete words around it, which translate into all of these other things we're going to talk about, including uh, how we how, what we have to do to ensure um, that our system uh, is, is diverse and inclusive uh, and that it's equitable to ensure that the allocation formula of the precious dollars we receive uh, from the legislature um, and really you know, from the taxpayers of this commonwealth are used in a way that help incentivize reaching those goals. That's a new approach. Uh, to looking at this. Um, so with those words in mind, I'm going to keep coming back to that. Um, this entire agenda is focused on that. Uh, this board has long ago moved away from the days where uh, agendas were administratively oriented um, or looking at you know contracts and program reviews and that sort of thing. Um, we now have agendas that are strategic and generative, and that's, this is an example today um, of what everybody uh, will see uh, with what takes place on this agenda. It's all about enrollment, and it's all about moving the system forward. So I think with that, um, those are my comments, and uh, I think we can now move into the public comment phase of our agenda. So, Randy, let me turn to you to facilitate that, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if there are any members of the public on the phone line who would like to offer comment, please push the star nine right now to raise your hand in Zoom. Uh, likewise, if there are any members of the public here in the room who would like to offer public comment, please approach the podium. We'll just give people a moment. Again, star nine to raise your hand online. All right, Madam Chair, there are no hands raised online and there's nobody here in the room. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Randy. Uh, so now I'm uh, pleased that we will be able to hear from our union leaders. Uh, let me call on Dr. Jamie Martin from APSCA first. Thank you. Chairwoman Shapira, Chancellor Greenstein, governors, university presidents and guests. As always, I appreciate being able to give remarks on behalf of the nearly 5,000 faculty and coaches that APSCUF represents at our 14 state-owned and state-supported universities. Over the past many months, I've highlighted the concerns that faculty have about dealing with COVID-19 on our campuses and in classrooms, concerns about the consolidation of six of our campuses into two new universities, and the impacts of retrenchment and retirements on our campuses. All of these issues and concerns remain, and thus are things that we will continue to highlight and work to address. Today, however, I wanna focus on the individuals that our system was created to serve, that the individuals the board supports and the individuals to whom our faculty and coaches devote their time, energy and expertise, our students. I had the opportunity to speak with the 14 APSCUF chapter presidents earlier this week, and this is what I heard. They expressed how impressed they are at the resilience of our students, that despite the pandemic, they have continued to work hard in the classrooms, continue to experience both team and individual success in athletics, and have continued to be recognized with scholarships and awards in their respective disciplines. Our students do amazing things while they're enrolled in our universities and after they leave them. They are the first responders, nurses, police officers, and physicians. They work with our children as teachers and counselors. They find success in business, in science, and the arts. They work for nonprofit organizations and in government. They take the lessons they have learned as student athletes and apply them to sports careers or other professional endeavors. 
We are the beneficiaries of their successes and they deserve our applause and our appreciation. I also heard, however, about the challenges that our students face as they progress through their academic careers. The chapter presidents expressed concerns that the effects of the pandemic, including feel feelings of isolation, have impacted the physical and mental health of some of our students. They identified problems with technology on a number of our campuses and the digital divide between students who can and cannot afford to purchase computers and to have access to reliable internet connectivity. They talked about the fact that students are now in classes that do not permit social distancing, are in classes that are over-enrolled and are facing difficulty scheduling upper division required courses. I heard about the concerns that our students have about being able to pay for tuition, fees, and books. And we have food pantries on all 14 of our campuses, and these are needed because of unprecedented food insecurity and hunger among our students. The mission of the state system of higher education is to provide a high quality education at the lowest possible cost to students. College is supposed to be affordable to them. Not fulfilling this mission can have many varied impacts. Let's consider food insecurity and consider what more we could do than provide food pantries. There's a nationwide program called Swipe Out Hunger. This program was founded by a group of college students in 2010 at UCLA. This nonprofit organization partners with college campuses nationwide to end student hunger. The premise is a fairly simple one. Students donate unused meals from their meal plans or swipes to other students who cannot afford a meal plan. There are, however, other options available in this program. There are nearly 400 universities that participate, including Clarion University. I encourage the Office of the Chancellor and our university presidents to consider making this a system-wide effort involve, and involve all 14 universities in this endeavor to end student hunger. The lack of affordability affects our students' ability to have what they need to be successful in the classroom, such as books and reliable technology. Some of our students do not have access to safe and affordable housing. It may prevent students who need to work from taking an unpaid internship that could greatly benefit their career trajectory. It affects their ability to get enough sleep or to be enrolled full time. The cost of college affects students' peace of mind and their abil ability to be fully focused on their academic and athletic pursuits. Affordability can mean many different things to many students but all of them present barriers to student success. We need to acknowledge and address these challenges that our students face. We need to fulfill the promise of a high quality and affordable college education. Our students deserve nothing less. APSCUF was heartened by the appropriations request that this board approved in October. The significant increase in funding for our universities that you supported can be a first step toward college affordability and a step toward fulfilling the mission of our system as laid out in Act 188. As you know, APSCUF has always been a strong advocate for appropriate funding for our state system and for our students, and we will continue that work. We will work with the state system to make the case for the need for increased funding, and we look forward to the governor's budget address next week. Thank you again for giving me the time to speak, and I wish you all continued good health. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin, appreciate it. Uh, and now let me call on uh, Melissa Bauer to speak on behalf of PAC. Good morning and thank you, Chair Shapiro, Board of Governors, Chancellor, System Leadership, Presidents and students and other trustees that are present for today's meeting. Thank you for having a report from the PA Council of Trustees known as PAC. Jack Wabi, our PAC president, was unable to make the meeting today and has asked me to fill in for him. PAC is working on our upcoming in-person conference that will be held at Hershey Lodge on March 24th and 25th. We are very excited about our plans for this upcoming conference. We will be having a session from our presidents at the universities, DEI, a session on legislative and advocacy, 
Our speakers and discussions will include the chancellor, the chair, Shapiro, the Department of Education Deputy Secretary and Commissioner for Post-Secondary and Higher Education, Dr. Tanya Garcia, system leadership, and hopefully a member of the legislative body. We will also be having our annual business meeting, which will include the election of officers for PAC for a two-year term starting July 1st, 2022. Any trustee who has not reached out but is interested in being an officer of PAC should reach out to our nominating committee, which includes Jack Wabi, Mary Koploff, and Jeff Smith. For new trustees, there will be a session focused on their roles and responsibilities at each of their institutions. This will also be open for existing trustees just in case they want to sharpen their their skills or recall some of the requirements that are that we have as trustees. We are looking forward to an excellent turnout and being together to have synergies and just see each other. PAC applauds the Board of Governors, the Chancellor, the system for the foresight of redesign. This is a collaborative effort and includes faculty, trustees, and students in the process. This process started many years ago and then COVID hit for the past two years. Our head start on working together by focusing on our mission of providing the highest quality education at the least cost to our students is an advantage that we have right now. As the chair said earlier today, this is key for student success for our Commonwealth going forward. Recently, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal that compared the COVID era to the Great Depression era in regards to the effect to the psyche of Americans. As the country exited the Great Depression era, families incorporated actions themselves based on their experience through that era. One of those actions was an appreciation and value for higher education. Many families, including my family, made it a priority for their children to attend college so they could rise out of poverty. Yesterday, during one of our workshops, Dr. Dale Pearson, president of three universities that will form Penn West University, showed a graph that illustrated the greater earnings for college graduates as compared to those who didn't attend college. This graph clearly made the distinction in earnings, but as we come out of the COVID era, we will also wanna highlight that college educated individuals had income stability, career stability, and work flexibility through remote work, and Zoom, and also fared better mentally during the COVID era. These are examples of the value that a college degree brings to individuals, and many will realize this during the COVID era. The second point Dr. Dale made was taking back our backyard. Where Clarion, she brought this thought to enrollment and we specifically focused on students in our region. As we exit the COVID era, many students and families will choose to be closer to their home and families just in case something happens again. Therefore, families through their experience during the COVID era are already recognizing the value from college education. Our jobs as trustees, the Board of Governors, system leadership, faculty and students is to continue to build and offer high demand quality education programs, focus on recruitment and retention processes and outreach so that this, this value of higher education is prevalent to students, families, potential and current employers in our regions and throughout the Commonwealth. I believe 
we can continue working together for success in stage three of system redesign. Thank you for allowing me to speak today on behalf of the trustees of the Pennsylvania Council of Trustees. Thank you so much, Melissa. Appreciate those remarks. Uh, and now let's move to the consent agenda. Um, we're going to consider consent agenda items in one motion, unless anybody wants any separated out. If so, please let me know now. Okay, you're all looking at your consent agenda. Good. And board members, if you want anything separated out, just click the raise hand feature in Zoom. See no hands, Madam Chair. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda then? Move approval. Second. Discussion? Okay. All and uh, no hands in Zoom. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, consent agenda passes. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move on now to the Government and Leadership Committee uh, report um, and session. So uh, let me hand the virtual gavel, even though I have a real one and he's in the room, um, to uh, Vice Chair Sam Smith to moderate uh, this Government Governance and Leadership Committee meeting session. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, this is the, the uh, Governance and Leadership Committee. And of course, we kind of carry it on as a, as a committee of the whole. So anyone's welcome to you know, speak up or ask questions. However, only the members of the actual committee will uh, participate in the voting part of it. So Chris, will you please take the roll? Yes, I will. Thank you. Uh, Governor Smith. Here. Governor Mazur. You're on mute. Here. Thank you. Senator Martin. Here. Governor Roberts. Here. Senator Swank. Here. And Chair Shapiro. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you very much. As we all know the committee's role is to provide policy oversight regarding the effective distribution of authority, accountability, and responsibility among the Board of Governors, Councils of Trustees, uh, the Chancellor, and the Presidents. Uh, today, we have two items for consideration. Uh, the first will be uh, uh, selecting a couple of trust student trustees for the respective uh, universities. Uh, the universities have worked with the chancellor's office to develop and utilize a recruiting process to identify and vet potential candidates in order to make a recommendation for the appointment. It's a process that's always been driven at the local level, and rightly so. Uh, because it's the universities that know their students the best. Uh, in the agenda packet, there's information regarding the two student trustees we'll be considering today. Uh, I can say as being a, a member of a council of trustees, I know how important this process is and, and how uh, uh, thorough these schools are in identifying the candidates uh, because we obviously you know, want to get the best student we can to participate in the uh, in the council meetings. So to begin, I will ask each president to say a couple words about their student candidate. And then after we've sort of introduced both candidates, um, we'll ask for a motion to consider both of them at one time. So we'll begin with uh, Janique Bant from Cal U and I'll ask President Pearson to do a little introductory. Thank you. Job on this. Let's do that. Janique Font, known lovingly as Neek on campus, is a senior at Cal U, majoring in secondary education mathematics. Neek is a very talented young person and pleased to have the opportunity to recommend his appointment to the, as a student trustee at Cal U. Neek has been active and involved in, in many student activities and many volunteer efforts since he joined Cal U in 2018. He is the president of the SAI Board of Directors reporting secretary for the Student Government Association, member of the Student Honors Advisory Board, where he serves as chair for the Academic and Professional Development Committee. He also is the president of the Co-Ed Volleyball Club and serves in many other university clubs, activities, organizations, and activisms. Outside of these, he generally advocates for students and volunteers his time 
with several worthwhile organizations, including Relay for Life and For the Children. Meek is exceptionally gifted, talented, a great communicator, and very professional in all efforts to advocate for students at Cal U. And I am honored to put him before you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pearson. We'll now turn to Re President Walton and have him introduce Kishore Owusu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm pleased to say a few words about Mr. Kishore Owusu. Kishore is a sophomore with a major in biology. He's a member of the Keystone Honors Academy, a member of MAPS, which is the Minority Association of Pre-Med Students, and actually is their public uh, relations person. Is a peer mentor or peer tutor for, in both biology and chemistry, and a member of the pre-law committee. Ashore was born in Ghana and moved to Philadelphia with his family in 2012 and graduated with honors from Northeast High School. Ashore is highly motivated and possesses the qualities that will serve him well, both as a student and in life. He feels that by being a good student, it's just not enough. He has a strong sense of community, of community and is eager to give back and pay it forward. Ashore is engaging articulate, and has a firm grasp of himself. He's eager to serve as a student trustee and represent the students and their voice as we make policy. In my estimation, he sure has the right headset, mindset, and heart set, and will serve us well. I'm pleased to enter him in consideration. Thank you, President Walton. Given these two names that have been presented us from Cal U and from Cheney, I would uh, ask if I could have a motion to recommend the Board of Governors appoint Janique Font to the California University Council Trustees and Kishore Owusu to the Cheney University Council Trustees. So moved. Moved and seconded. Second. Is, is there any discussion or other comment on these two nominees? I see no hands raised, Mr. Chair. There's um, Andy Garcia. I'd like to uh, welcome Janique to the board, uh, to the Council of Trustees, and I look forward to you joining edu uh, the educator workforce here in Pennsylvania, Janique. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment? No hands on Zoom. Discussion? Thank you very much. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the uh, nominations are confirmed. Um, unfortunately, Janique had a conflict and couldn't be with us, but I believe uh, Kishore is on the Zoom. Randy, can you? Yes. Oh, and you're welcome to say a few words and welcome to the Pashi family more formally. Give Kishore a moment to unmute and he should be able to join us. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning. And I am beyond honored to have been recommended by my president, President Walton, to be um, the student representative at Cheney University. I look forward to the great work that's to come and to being a voice of reason and a fair voice for the students, both at Cheney and throughout the past year system. Thank you very much. Thank you and good luck. <laughs> It's one of those things uh, that the more you put in it, the more you get out of it. So I hope that you, uh, you, you know, I hope you have the good fortune to be really engaged in the process because I think it's a, it's a great educational opportunity for the students. Uh, I'm always kind of envious of them a little bit, uh, the ones we see through our school anyways. Um, the second order of business is uh, to take up a resolution that is intended to ensure that the current trustees from all six of the universities that make up the two integrated will have opportunity to, you know, to provide input and uh, to you know, still be a part of the, uh, the governance, I guess you could say, and the management of the, of the respective uh, schools. Um, this resolution, I'm gonna ask Randy to kind of explain it a little more thoroughly though. It really just sort of uh, 
puts in place the, the 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 process to identify how to best do that. Really, it's not it's not doing anything other than just formally saying we need to look at this. Um, kind of vest the power officially in the chancellor and the president, um, which I thought was very novel, Madam Chair. Um, because if you're part of it, then we're part of it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was discreet, but Randy, please uh, explain it more you bet. specifically. Um, as you'll hear later today, the integrations efforts are moving forward. Progress is being made, and you'll hear from the presidents on that later today. Uh, and as those plans move through the process, the team is working to identify those areas that need some, some addressing re relative to how do, how do we make sure that all three institutions within each integration are heard and are part of the decision-making processes. And that is true also at the Council of Trustees level. So uh, one thing to remember in all of this, and you will recall this uh, as board members, uh, the integrations plans call for the new integrating universities in the West and the East to essentially retain the accreditation of one of their institutions um, in order so that uh, the, the new integrated institution uh, can continue and, 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 and uh, have seamless accreditation. Uh, in the West, the, the, it was chosen to keep Cal U's accreditation and build upon its accreditation. In the e Northeast, it was chosen to keep uh, Bloomsburg accreditation and build upon it, frankly, because they had just gone through their recertification with middle states, and that gives us the longest uh, runway to to work with. Um, and, and so doing that, and that's important for the students because making that choice to do that uh, ensures that students can, can continue to benefit from a seamlessly accredited institution, namely federal financial aid availability. Had we gone another route, which is seek initial new accreditation for the new institutions, things would have gotten more complicated. Uh, but also having made that decision, that means then if if nothing else changes, the, in the West and the Northeast, then the, uh, the Council of Trustees for Cal U and the Council of Trustee for Bloom will become the, the default council for the newly integrated institution. And so we've said from the beginning that the system is committed to ensuring all the voices in all six institutions are heard through this process. And since this board doesn't control who sits on councils of trustees, that's a a function of the governor and the legislature working together, the Senate who confirms. We also don't control the makeup and the composition of the councils of trustees. That is a, a matter of statutory uh, construct. What we do control is how we interact and the engagement we seek when it comes to decisions that are made by councils of trustees. So the law spells out very clearly those things that councils of trustees are engaged in and, and what they talk about and what they what, what flows through them. And so what this resolution does, it says, we're going to create in the West and the Northeast quasi-council bodies that would ensure that in the West, all three institutions have a voice in those elements that councils of trustees statutorily have input on. And we're gonna do the same thing in the Northeast. And those quasi-council bodies will continue and persist until some time when we have a, a, a construct or a uh, appointed makeup of the official councils that give us confidence that there is complete representation across all six institutions. This resolution, as you said, Mr. Chair, this resolution charges the, the chancellor and the president of those institutions to work with those quasi councils to make sure that in those instances, when it comes to, let's say, uh, appointing or evaluating a president, uh, approving academic programs, uh, vetting university policies, all those things that are spelled out in the statute, councils, that we will also seek the input of those quasi-councils along the way, and the president and the chancellor will be held accountable to ensure that that happens um, before any action comes to the board or is, or is finalized. This resolution calls for the creation of a procedure and standard to operationalize that, but it simply underscores your commitment that all six institutions will be heard and that we are interested in, in having an engaging and collaborative process. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Randy. Um, I'd just like to, not to put you on the spot, Melissa, but since I know this was discussed um, with the last PAC call with the trustees, with the chancellor, and I think it's an issue, you know, uh, in in the circle of, you know, trustees, do you have any <coughs> thoughts or comments just in general about this? Well, um, I've worked closely with Randy and um, so has PAC in regards to making sure 
that our bylaws will <clears throat> reflect that trustees remain from the integrating universities as members of MAC, uh, I'm sorry, of PAC until our um, terms are over. We also believe that having a set of policies that require <coughs> the Cal and Bloom to utilize information and opinions and insights coming from the other two institutions up through the trustees is key. So we support the policy that Brandy's talking about. Does that answer your question, Sam? Yep. Yeah, no, if, yeah, I just, uh, like I said, given I, I know that, 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 you know, it's an, you know, it's an issue for the trustees uh, as a whole. And um, I know that it had been part of some of the PAC related discussions. So I just, I just wanted to afford you an opportunity to, to comment uh, freely. I don't know if there are any Thank other you. comment or discussion, questions or concerns, and hearing uh, none. I'll um, check for Zoom it, hands real quick, Mr. Chair. No Zoom hands. Oh. Uh, I believe oh, Senator sorry, Martin, Martin actually. Yeah. Hold on, let me scroll. I'm sorry, Senator. Go for it. No, it's okay. I, I just want to add in, a, I know some members of PACT had approached me in, from the role of the Senate Education Committee to, to help work with them and others if, if there's things that have to be fixed moving forward legislatively um, to address the, the the issues that people have brought up that, you know, we're, we're willing to work with everybody to try to see what we can uh, do to protect that, that what we're trying to accomplish here. Thank you, Senator. Um, I guess I got the cart a little ahead of the horse. First, I should probably ask for a motion uh, mm -hmm. to consider this resolution. May I have a motion to do so? So moved. And a second? Second. Thank you very much. Um, now, is there any other discussion or comment on the resolution? Hearing none, I'll ask for a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the resolution is adopted. With that, I believe that concludes our business at the committee level, Madam Chair. So this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Committee meeting, that is. Thank you very much. <laughs> Talk about getting ahead of yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, and uh, before I uh, turn the meeting over to uh, our other Vice Chair, David Mazur, uh, who uh, also chairs the Student Success Committee. Um, I uh, want to reach out to Senator Martin and uh, from all of us, our very best wishes for a, a speedy recovery. And um, I hope things are going well after your surgery. Thank you. I really appreciate that very much. Okay, good. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you back. Um, all right, uh, I do now want to turn the meeting over uh, to uh, David Mazur, who's chair of the Student Success Committee, um, to introduce a very uh, special Student Success Spotlight moment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, sorry, I can't be there with you all in person. Um, well, I, I, I'm not recovering from surgery, my wife is. So, you know, Scott and, and Allie are both sharing uh, various boots and, and uh, you know, stabilizers this week. So I, I certainly feel your pain. Um, but uh, we're here to talk about a wonderful program. So um, I need you all to put your thinking caps on because um, if you can imagine putting roller coasters and chocolate together, then you'll, you'll get some idea of where this program is headed. Um, I just wanna take a few moments to highlight a unique collaboration between the Hershey Entertainment and Resort Company and Shippensburg University. This cooperation not only helps Hershey Entertainment and Resorts address its workforce needs in Hershey Park, but helps college students develop and grow their leadership potential, focusing specifically on core competencies to better prepare them for their future success. As board members, we understand the critical role our institutions play in supporting our economic partners throughout the Commonwealth. We also focus on the importance of ensuring our students are successful when they graduate, more than just receiving a diploma. The Hershey Park Leadership Development Internship Program 
as a collaboration has done both. We are grateful that Hershey Entertainment Resorts has chosen Chippensburg as their partner. I would now like to ask uh, President Patterson to introduce today's speakers. Mr. President. Thank you, Governor Mazur. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to introduce the Hershey Internship Program. I had the opportunity actually a few weeks ago to formally present this program to our Council of Trustees and all of those in attendance during the meeting. Andy Helmer, Vice President of Human Relations, and Kathleen McGraw, Managing Director of Communications and Corporate Social Responsibility, joined us at that meeting and not only shared their perspective on this unique collaboration, but reinforced Hershey Entertainment and Resort's commitment to the program with a $30,000 donation to support the program's sustainability and expansion of the program at Shippensburg. I want to thank Hershey Entertainment Resort's generosity for this because Shippensburg University started 2022 by adding a unique dimension to our career design program, including faculty micro grants to leverage the brilliance of our Shippensburg University faculty around career design. I would now like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Sue McCurgy, Vice President of Student Strategy and Success, who helped spearhead this effort. Sue? Thank you. Hello, everyone. Great to be here. I'm going to follow some scripts so that I don't go over my time. Randy won't be happy about that. So <laughs> thank you, Chancellor Greenstein, governors, presidents, for this opportunity to share our partnership success story. On behalf of our brilliant faculty and staff who make magic happen at SHIP every day. So this story is really about a program that helped our students thrive as learners and workers in an environment that paid attention to their happiness. And the PowerPoint will help you imagine that. We believe efforts like this uh, position Shippensburg as an ins institution of the future. Let me introduce you to talented colleagues who are here today to share this program with us. Dan McKeever, Dan is uh, joining us uh, uh, virtually, senior from California University and 2021 Hershey, Hershey Park Leadership Development Internship. Andy Helmer and Kathleen McCraw, President Patterson introduced them. Marie Conley, Board of Governor Emeritus, Marie served as a project manager for HENR to design this internship and now serves as its academic coordinator. Dr. Peter Garland, who helped design frame the curriculum, could not join us today. And a big shout out to our Shippensburg University career team who helped deliver this program from conception to launch to completion of the first cohort of students. I'd also like to thank the other 13 career centers for the work they do, so critical for Shippensburg, uh, for our student success. So in 2019, Shippensburg University and HENR had ambitious goals with what we discovered had common solution. Three realities were driving us at SHIP. We needed to scale internships knowing the impact it has on our students. We wanted to respond to the outsized employer demand for soft skills or human skills. And we were looking at additional venues to infuse this into our students before they enter the job market. And data illustrated the disproportionalities that existed in internships with first gen students being overrepresented in the never intern group and underrepresented in the paid intern group in the United States. From Marie, we learned about the vision and commitment that Hershey Entertainment and Resorts had in creating a new internship that was grounded in the core values of their founder, Pennsylvania icon, Milton Hershey. Knowing Shippensburg's commitment to workforce alignment and the expertise we housed, HENR decided that Shippensburg would be an excellent partner on this project, we agreed. The 2021 class of Hershey Park Leadership Development Internship arrived in May, after one year delayed due to COVID, the partnership had officially survived the pandemic. A diverse group of 179 students representing more than 100 colleges from across the country, 24 from our system, and 11 from Shippensburg. 
What differentiates this internship from others is the 12 week leadership curriculum that is a part of the students work. Students were hired to work in fr frontline positions in a variety of departments. They resided in a beautiful private housing at Penn State Harrisburg that some of you in Harrisburg could consider for a staycation. Executives from HENR interacted with the students and experts, including our faculty and staff and industry experts were brought in to help develop the students' leadership attributes. The curriculum included in your handout began with a self-assessment and ended with reflection. And students were introduced to problem solving and soft skills like service orientation. That. <laughs> I, 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 I was just I was just debating whether I was going to criticize Randy for allowing this to take place without samples. A round of applause for Randy for bringing happiness around. Thank you. And thank you, Andy and Kathleen. So the curriculum included in your handout began with a self-assessment and like I said, ended with reflection. And week six was the big chocolate challenge. Throughout the challenge, extreme pivots were introduced. And at the end, there was a winning team. I was so fortunate and humbled to be one of the three judges and observe, and this is important, the degree of critical thinking and leadership strategies these young students were exercising. At the conclusion, students received a certificate in leadership development from Shippensburg University and many received internship credits from their home universities. There are many stories, but you need to hear from Dan, an accounting senior from California University and learn from his firsthand experience. Dan. Hi everyone. <laughs> so you wanna hear about my experience with the internship. I, when I first found out about this internship through my school, uh, through the Career Center, I thought this was the perfect internship for, for someone like me. And through this internship, I was able to learn how to be flexible in a new department as I just started in the food and beverage industry while working at Hershey. And I also learned a lot through the classes taught by Marie and Kathleen and Shippensburg. I learned a lot about how to manage my time better as well as how to think on the spot critically. And through all the hard work that I did through my internship, I actually got the opportunity at our intern luncheon to sit with John Lawn, who is the CEO of Hershey Entertainment, as well as Gene Barr, the president of the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. And Marie picked me because she said that I embodied everything that the internship wants. And overall, one of the one of the biggest takeaways from my experience that I will always remember is the memories and the friendships that I made with my fellow interns and friends who I still speak with on this day. And I can't say enough about how much of an amazing experience this internship was. And I want to thank Marie and Hershey for everything they've done for me in this internship. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. No thank problem. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> President Patterson had the privilege of uh, meeting Emily from Shippensburg University. Just learned Emily, Emily now has a full-time uh, full internship, probably on her way uh, to the upward trajectory that we won this internship for. So um, thank you again, Dan. And I'd like to now invite Andy. Um, before, you know, uh, before Andy speaks, I did want to share with you the amount of, uh, you know, contribution that HENR does. President Patterson did talk about the gener generosity, but Andy also serves on the HENR Foundation, as well as several uh, university, he works with them and the foundations uh, for your hospitality program. Andy? Good morning, everyone. Uh, you okay if I take this off to speak? Thank you. Um, I just wanna say thank you very much for allowing, allowing me to be here. Thank you for allowing me to, uh, to be a part of PASHI. Um, Dan with the foundation, thank you for allowing me to, uh, to be a part of the foundation. I have to start off by saying thank you to, to Sue, Dr. McCurgy, um, Marie, where she's taking photos over there. 
uh, governors, presidents, thank you for allowing me to be here today. Uh, Hershey Entertainment and Resorts has, I think, fused a great bond with uh, PASHI and with Shippensburg University specifically on this internship program. If we think about our youth in America, we think about what we're trying to do with us helping students get that first internship. It's really tough, in my, in my opinion, for a student to get their second internship until they have their first one. And if their first one can be one that has some uh, name recognition to it, it's a great chance for us in the organization, in PASHI, and in my organization to help them get their second internship. Emily Kurtz from Shippensburg is an intern in my department for this spring. And as long as she's willing, she's going full time in May for me in training development. Um, she's a great individual. So thank you, Shippensburg, for that. As a Pennsylvanian, I want to see as many students graduate from Pennsylvania schools stay in Pennsylvania. I want to see that happen. We need that in this, um, in our uh, Commonwealth. Before we take questions or before I sit down again, I want everyone in this room to know the yeoman's work that Dr. Sue McCurgy has done, her team, and Marie Conley, who will gladly sit in the back and not take any credit for it because of who she is, but thank you, thank you again. And that is it. We'd be happy to take any questions. Um, I have a question. Um, how do students get into the program? How, how do we make sure more Apache students get involved with the program? Well, all you have to do is um, let me know. And, and that, can you guys uh, take off the slides so those of us virtually can actually see who's in the room? Thank you. That, that would be great. So uh, <laughs> I'm assuming that question came from uh, the screen above my head. Uh, so did. what we do was... is we, we use Handshake to communicate with all the schools. And we have personal relationships with all the Apache schools and obviously other, other schools um, in, in, in the states. We will, uh, if I could fill them all with Apache students, that would make my day a lot easier. <laughs> so I'll be blunt, that'd be great. If we can work that out, that'd be wonderful. But uh, my team will uh, come on all the campuses. We get uh, applications, we interview, we do virtual interviews because what we don't wanna do is have a, have a student have to make the trip to Hershey because not every student has a vehicle, right? We have to think about these things. So a uh, student uh, applies, we interview and we offer, we have housing coordinated with Penn State with the college town communities, which is located over at Penn State Harrisburg. We have shuttle bus that transports because again, not every student has a vehicle that they can get back and forth. So we're trying to make sure that we can meet the student where they're at so we can get them to their future where they belong. Thank you. Great, and, um, thank you. Also, um, Governor Mazur, um, you know, information is available at all our career centers. Uh, this is a support for all our career centers. It's not that easy to come up with this sort of internship in the employment circles that we are moving right now in the pandemic. So I'd highly encourage that participation with our 14 career centers. Good to know, thank you. Thank you very much and thank you randy for uh, one comment from skyler i mean how, how's all the candy folks those of us here virtually don't get me <laughs> we'll be mailing them to you can we uh -huh. we we could mail them to you or we could leave them here and if they're here when you get here next time yeah. <laughs> i know the answer we'll to save, that question we'll, we'll save wrappers for you i mean i didn't get any groundhog cookies yesterday i don't That's get any true. Okay. today <laughs> I don't get the free Skyler line. Has her hand up. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to make a small comment. Um, as a student at Shippensburg University, I know I've looked into this program and I'm very excited um, of the collaborative measures that's going into this program. I see it from a student's perspective as like, oh my gosh, I can work in a museum park? Like what? That's always been like a childhood dream. Like I've never told anybody that, but um, I'm really excited for this program. I'm, I'm excited that we're doing this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was as well a, uh, I started uh, at Hershey Park in food and beverage. So, uh, you know, I think where we start in life isn't, doesn't depend on where we end in life, but it definitely creates a foundation for our future. 
So thank you. Thank you for everyone. And I'll just end with one thing that talent exists equally in our system, opportunity does not. And I hope you take this up. Thank you. And uh, Secretary Garcia. Uh, at first, uh, I was going to donate my Hershey bar in accordance with the executive gift ban to trustee <laughs> to Governor Smith. But now that you know there are other people on Zoom that did not have this opportunity, let me know who I should send it to. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, I uh, I hand the Hershey gavel back to you. Thank you very much. That was a delightful and I might say uh, delicious presentation. So we we enjoyed it, and uh, uh, again, Secretary. Uh, Thank you for your selflessness. I'm moved. I'm personally moved. Um, okay, continuing now with our agenda, uh, I now want to turn to uh, Vice Chancellor Dr. Denise Pearson, who is also our Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for the state system, uh, to talk about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts um, and how it's all fitting together in this framework that we, we talked about with regard to um, this stage in our redesign uh, intensively around enrollment and student success. I'm gonna take this off, is that okay? Thank you, Madam Chair, and good, after, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm gonna just give you updates on two very positive uh, DEI um, topics, and they are the, um, DEI summit that took place November 3rd through the 5th of last year, and the um, system-wide climate survey that is underway. So beginning, and both of them um, have implications for enrollment, for um, uh, closing out equity gaps, and you know for all of the five priorities that were affirmed during the April uh, 15th board uh, meeting. So um, starting with the uh, 2021, the EI summit that was held November 3rd through the 5th. It was very successful by all measures and conversations are already underway for the fall 2022 summit. For the 2021 summit, a thousand people registered, 544 attended at least one session, 112 speakers spoke. There were a total of 44 sessions. The keynote sessions were attended by more than 120 people each. Concurrent sessions ranged from 10 to 122 attendees. All 14 universities participated with Bloomsburg University leading the way, followed by Mansfield and Westchester universities. Post summit surveys were administered. We received 120 responses. The feedback was overwhelmingly positive. And again, conversations are already underway for this next year. And we will be seeking input from everyone to make sure that it's even better than last year, but better in the sense in how it serves the system and um, all of our uh, various stakeholder groups. As we continue to build awareness and capacity to create and maintain diverse, equitable and inclusive um, systems of higher education, I encourage the board and PAC members to take advantage of these uniquely PASHI convenings and hope to see you at the 2022 convening. With regard to the PASHI system-wide climate survey, we recently launched the first ever system-wide climate survey on January 31st. It is being conducted by a third party survey bet vendor to ensure privacy and confidentiality. The survey was distributed to more than 70,000 students, more than 10,000 employees, including faculty and staff. And it was uh, um, administered across the system's 14 universities and the system office. It was uh, launched um, January 31st, and it will stay open through March 4th. 
We anticipate getting survey results back um, mid-April, um, before the end of the month of April for sure. And we have assembled a group and we're starting to talk about what we are going to do with that data to make sure that it's not just something that gets collected and um, sits on a shelf and we don't do anything with it. Um, but we know for sure that, you know, presidents are poised and ready to take the lead to talk with their communities about what they're going to do, how they're going to use the data to make improvements on their respective campuses. So those are my two updates and I welcome any questions that anyone may have. Hold on, hold on technical conversation. Um, okay. Are you Dr. Pearson, uh, Denise, that was, um, I just wanted to, while well, you're yeah, sorting out technical ahead. difficulties, I just wanted to comment on the, uh, the summit in particular, which just, what a phenomenal event. It's, you know, it's Dr. Martin's uh, opening remarks talked about the resilience of our students and the um, summit demonstrated the, the incredible innovation and dedication of our faculty and staff uh, who are helping our students uh, through some of the most challenging times. It was I attended most of the uh, the summit, as I know many of us did, and it was just one powerful um, session after another. Uh, so it's, it was a great, great start to I know what will continue to hopefully continue. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, appreciate it uh, very, very much. Um, I. Uh, did skip, uh, I thought it was actually later in our board agenda, um, but we should have voted as a full board um, after uh, uh, the governance and leadership committee meeting uh, as, a, as a full board to vote on the items that that um, committee brought to the board. Those are items um, 8A and 8B, I believe. Um, so I am going to do that now uh, since we are in full board session. Um, I don't know, Sam, do we need, does anybody feel that they need a reminder um, about those items? That was uh, the student trustee appointment um, and the resolution regarding the role of the uh, councils of trustees at the integrating universities, just as a reminder. Are there, are there any questions? And can I have a motion please to bring those to the full board for approval? So moved. Second. Thank you. And is there any discussion? And I'll check Zoom. Hearing none, all in favor? Uh, and this is the full board. Uh, I, I see aye. no hands on Zoom, so. No hands on Zoom. No hands on Zoom, okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, that motion carries. Thank you very much, appreciate that. Um, at this point, we're gonna take a uh, short break and um, the Zoom and webcast will remain live uh, while we are on break. Mandy's already put it up. It's a 10 minute break. Thank you.
Okay, thank you everyone. We are we are reconvened. Um, and now uh, I would like to um, turn the mic over to the Chancellor, uh, Dan, for your remarks this morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, everybody. So let me begin. This is uh, as we enter this new and critical year. Um, so my remarks might be a little longer than usual. Um, there is no deck, Governor Smith. I'm sorry. Um, the uh, I want to I want to start by um, thanking our faculty and staff again. Dr. Martin was absolutely right to call out the resiliency of our students um, and uh, their success and their continued progress uh, is really down to the work of our faculty and staff. And they have been tremendous through a very challenging period that we're all frustrated by, the continued uh, uh, pandemic, et cetera, but also the fact that our, our system redesign is happening and transformational work is hard and, and our students need to continue their journey uh, even as we evolve and change. And it is our faculty and staff that enable that to happen. And I wanna shout out an enormous debt of gratitude. I wanna also, uh, 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 particularly for uh, faculty and staff in, in institutions undergoing some tremendous change, obviously, um, and many are uh, uh, at IUP, at Cheney, and of course at our integrating universities. And I wanna just pause a moment there and we'll check in a bit later with them. But um, you know, this is, we're, we're in implementation. We are running towards open in July. And, and um, so there's a lot that has to happen. You know, our leadership teams have to fire, new leadership teams have to fire on all cylinders. Uh, our IT folks have to, you know, blend uh, technology environments and our faculty have to blend our curriculum and, and uh, all of that work is tremendous. It's fast paced um, and a shout out to everyone involved in it, uh, the curriculum work in particular and the IT work is particularly challenging. So thank you to the, to the leadership, frankly, that's being uh, demonstrated on, on, on in all those quarters. Um, uh, let, me, let me turn to the, um, quick reflection on where we've been and where we're going. And, and, and uh, Madam Chair, this reflects some of the comments that you made. Uh, you know, I wanna speak directly to the board in um, demonstrating tremendous courage in approaching the transformation of the system in the interest of our students and in the interest of this commonwealth. That courage was recognized recently by the Association of Governing Boards through its uh, award to this board of the uh, John Nason, I think it was called award, which really is um, an award given to boards that are making. Association. Association of Governing Boards. An award given to uh, boards of higher education institutions who are um, you know, making basically transformative change in the interests of their students. So congratulations, that is not an easy award to win. Uh, it is not one that you can go out and lobby for. It is a recognition of, of your peers about your progress. And you are making progress. Your focus on our student affordability, and I'm gonna, I'm not gonna rain, I'm, I'm not gonna steal um, uh, uh, Kate Aker's thunder, but I might just clap a little bit in advance. <laughs> You'll see in the presentation that she'll, that, that you've, you've, you've bent the student affordability curve, you've bent the curve, which is pretty hard to do. You've er, begun to arrest our financial decline. You'll see that too. Um, you're gonna see, and you know this, that our, our programs uh, increasingly align uh, with the needs of our employers in the, in the state. Uh, and just to reflect on the, the presentation that Kate gave us in October, uh, we now have evidence that our students not only go through our programs and get good jobs um, in the high demand occupation areas, but that our universities themselves act as elevators of social mobility. Students who enter as low income are earning as much 10 years out, more or less, as students who enter our universities. As, so that's good. Uh, you'll see some pretty tremendous progress with our student um, uh, uh, student progress towards their degree. Our four-year graduation rates are higher than ever. We're even showing in some of our universities that we can shrink those attainment gaps that exist between low and high income, between black and white, between urban and rural. And there's tremendous opportunity. And this didn't just happen. That stuff doesn't just materialize. The curves that you're seeing don't just bend themselves. It results from your consistency and your focus on ensuring that our students, Madam Chair, if I can borrow your phrase, get in, get a degree, and get a job. Um, on your, uh, on our presidents, advised by their councils of trustees, working closely with their faculty and staff, demonstrating that with 
focus and courage and ability and willingness to make very difficult trade-off decisions and to support their colleagues in what is really a massive change management effort that we can and we do succeed. And it reflects real shifts in our organizational culture, which are harder to discern. You can't see them in the training. A, a, a handful that you have advocated for are beginning to show up. That ensuring that our communities, our university, are welcoming to all of their members and provide all of our members opportunity to advance, that that is a design principle, not an afterthought in everything we do. Shows up now routinely. The fact that we put our students first in everything we do. How many conversations I've had, not just with presidents, but other uh, leaders talking about the decisions they need to make and how in making the decisions they ask themselves, how does this benefit our students? The fact that goal-oriented, data-driven decision-making is now common. It shows up in everything we do, from procurement contracts through to the investments we make in a constellation of student supports through to the design of our academic program. And the fact that we're beginning to embrace change as a constant and recognizing that our universities, our students will flourish because we innovate, because we're entrepreneurial, and because we hustle. All of that is beginning to show up in the way we speak and talk and work. Pennsylvania's state-owned higher education system works. Our universities work. They demonstrate the power and the promise of public higher education as the last most reliable bridge to opportunity for students who so need that bridge to opportunity. It is the last most reliable way into a sustaining career, into meaningful and effective participation in the 21st century and contributions to a community. There is one curve we haven't bent yet. Let's do with enrollment. And this is the most important curve of all. Why? I'm going to take it from a workforce perspective. 60% of the jobs in Pennsylvania today require someone in them with some form of post-secondary education. That's everything from a welding certificate through to a doctorate in, neuro in neuroscience. 60% of all jobs today. Only 51% of the adults in the state have a post-secondary credential. We're behind, and that gap is growing, and that gap is slowing down the economy of Pennsylvania relative to the economy in other states. The jobs are here or could be here. The people to fill them are not. Making affordable, effective pathways through post-secondary education is the only way to close that gap. It is the only way to secure the health and safety and economy of the state of Pennsylvania. So we did a little analytical exercise, built a little model. Um, probably not going to win a Nobel Prize, but kind of neat. We asked ourselves, if we were to contribute our share to Pennsylvania, the, our share, what's our current share of all the credentials that we produce, if we were to contribute that share, to filling that gap, what does that require? About 2,000 bachelor's degrees more per year, the 10% increase, about 1,200 master's degree more per year, about a 50% increase, and about two to 4,000 non degree credentials per year. That's a massive increase. So then we looked at that and said, okay, get that. How many students do we need? Because you're going to produce more credentials, you're going to put more students through the system. How many students more do we need? To, to meet to fill that gap to, to, to create those credentials about a hundred to one hundred and ten thousand we hundred to one hundred and ten thousand enrollments annually enable us so you, when we talk about growth reinvestment reinvigoration it's not an abstract concept it's a number right 
That's where we need to get to. And, and of course, growth is important for so many other reasons. It's not just about you know, employer demand, although super important if you want to consider the long-term health and economic competitiveness of the state. The engine of social mobility is also important. It's a way to drive social. And there are other good reasons. How about jobs? I can't remember what our target student faculty ratio is, like 18 or 19 to one. I mean, to every additional 18 or 19 students, potentially another faculty job. I don't know what 18 or 19, between here where we are and 110,000 or 100,000, is about, I don't know, 15, 20,000. Do the math. That's, and, 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 and how about jobs in the communities that we serve? When we did the economic impact study for integration, we discovered that the biggest impact on the regional economies had nothing to do with jobs within our universities. It was expenditure of student dollars in the communities and as student enrollments decline, those dollars spent in the communities decline. So in terms of our economic impact, there are all sorts of good reasons to grow. And we know how to bend the enrollment curve and we know with whom we need to bend the enrollment curve, our core market. Our core market consists of low and middle income high school graduates. We are in the that's who we serve as a matter of mission. It consists of high school graduates in the regions our universities occupy and serve. To uh, Trustee Melissa Bauer's point earlier, recapturing our backyard is critical to our future. It includes community college transfer students who are going in the most really efficient means towards their post-secondary credentials starting in the community college to a four-year university. It includes historically underserved students. Why? Probably because historically underserved students are growing in terms of proportion to the population. Probably because unless we serve all these communities better, we and the state can't meet its workforce development. It includes students who are entering into programs leading to high demand occupation, STEM and technology, healthcare, et cetera. And it includes others who need our help to get a leg up into the 21st century. Students who are college ready, graduating from high school, able, capable, post-secondary education, but who are not going. It includes students who are not able to attend a residential for whatever reason degree experience. It includes adults. It includes people who are seeking non-degree credentials. We know where that growth will come from. It includes our ability to retain the students we have. We know where that growth will come from. And we will see evidence that we actually know how to support those students in their success. And we designed our system redesign, we planned our system redesign to tackle this challenge. This was the challenge we started out to address. The objective was get our arms around our financial stability, to get our house in order, as the chairwoman said, and then prepare to and invest in reinvigoration and growth. And thank God for the ARP funding committed by the General Assembly last year, and hopefully for recurring years because it has launched us into this space. But to bend this enrollment curve, to achieve that growth, we have to refashion our partnership. The cost of attending Pennsylvania State University is too high in ways that reflect historic patterns of funding. We priced ourselves out of the market. And we are the most affordable post-secondary, four-year post-secondary option in the state. And we have priced ourselves out of the market. We are squeezing particularly hard low and middle income students who we serve, who can have to pay up to 40% of a household income in order to send one child, our, one of our universities for one year. And we're basically saying as a state that we're okay, given that post-secondary education is the pathway to a sustaining career, that we are okay denying 
that pathway to the largest part of our citizenry. We're saying that we're okay not being able to keep the lights on in our economy because we are unable or unwilling to educate enough students to meet employer demand. And I got news for you. It's a math problem. There are not enough wealthy, academically prepared students left in the state to meet our credentialing needs. Unless we do better with the core opportunities, with the low and the middle income students that we serve, with the historically underserved students representing a growing population in the state, with adults who are coming back to college with uh, uh, looking for online and hybrid experiences with students who are college ready but not yet college bound. We can't fill the workforce. And we're in this bind because those students who we need to enter and succeed in a post secondary experience are priced out of that experience. And we cannot address that problem on our own. We have taken enormous, made enormous strides, and you'll see them, in ensuring that we bend the price curve for our students. And we've basically done that by cutting ourselves even further, taking $100 million out of our operating expenditure annually so we can give that to our students. As we become more efficient through our work on sustainability, there's nothing left to cut. Nothing that will significantly change the price for our students. We need the help of the state. With significant additional investment in this system and its students, Pennsylvania can restore and reinvigorate public higher education. It can enhance the state's competitiveness, expand opportunity for social mobility, respond to employers' urgent needs, the talent they need to succeed. Our state owners can make that significant investment with confidence based on the demonstrable evidence that we have intentionally demonstrated that we are, we have the necessary capability. I remember discussions of this board three years ago now where we deliberately delayed approaching the state for significant investment and we could, until we proved to ourselves that we were able to respond to the many valid concerns that were being raised about our cost and our Managers and our overruns and our transparency and accountability. And we have met and addressed all those concerns. Now we need to come back in this phase to the state and ask for them to make a policy choice about what kind of society we want. I think, as Kate will show, we've demonstrated our capability in serving our core student market, our capability to fundamentally shift and change. Our owners, I think, can invest with confidence based on evidence that funding will be used well in pursuit of clearly and publicly defined goals, resulting in improved outcomes for all our students. Our owners, our funders, they can invest with confidence based on demonstrable evidence. We invite accountability for how we use taxpayer dollars, that we want to be held to the highest performance standards, and that we are proud to discuss publicly our strengths, our progress, and also areas that require urgent attention. Now, this year is the time to choose. Because we have demonstrated practically, meaningfully, we are ready and able to deliver with stewardship on the promise of public higher education, to reignite public higher education as a critical engine of the Commonwealth's economic development and its social mobility. And because in 2022, having kicked the can down the road for so long with the state system, we're not just out of road. Our time. So thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, your remarks are very much appreciated. They uh, uh, really, uh, help to frame both what has come before uh, my earlier remarks 
and what we're going to uh, the presentation we're going to get now, and the and the rest of the business. And so, let me let me just say again because I said we were going to be reiterating this over and over and over again. Um, you know, uh, we still have a ways to go. There are still bumps in the road. Uh, not everything, obviously, uh, is done perfectly all the time. Um, but by and large, over the past uh, over the past four years, um, we've just made a sea change in the way um, that uh, that we have approached our work, um, have held ourselves accountable, um, have sought to deliver results at every level um, to the state, to our stakeholders, to the legislature, to the governor. Um, and the, the, as Dan said, you know, Kate, Kate's gonna be making a presentation that gives some, I guess, tangible uh, evidence of this and the, the essential um, metric curves that we've been seeking to bend um, and now the big one is, is out there and it's all about enrollment, uh, you know, as it's been framed. So I think with that, Kate, let me, let me turn it to, over to you. Kate Akers is our Associate Vice Chancellor for Data Analytics uh, and you're gonna walk us through an update now on, on these metrics and where we are. Thank you. Um, oh, I sound quite loud. Is that okay? Everybody okay? Sorry, didn't realize I was so loud. Fantastic. Um, first of all, I just want to take a moment to really commend this board, the chancellor, our university presidents on their, on their commitment to data transparency and accessibility. I think this is really evidence in the progress that we're about to see and highlight, as well as how they um, and how you all are addressing some of the challenges and the opportunities that I'm about to show. This emphasis on accountability has really been demonstrated through, through the tenure of system redesign. So I'm excited to show you some of these real trends that we're following, um, but also to highlight some of this great work um, that we know that is in progress and some, some additional opportunities. So as we, as we, as we, transition to the, to the first slide, I'll say that we're really beginning to see um, real evidence of growth and progress despite some of the enrollment trends that we have alluded to today. So this first chart in particular, this is looking at the change over time in average net price. For those of you that may not be familiar with this term, um, the net price of attending a university or college is the largest single impediment to post-secondary participation in Pennsylvania. And this is particularly true for low and middle income students. These students are already disproportionately being served and their post-secondary participation in the state disproportionately relies upon to eliminate our talent gap, this workforce gap um, that the chancellor mentioned in his open remarks. So as you can see from this, this chart, increasing um, the percent change in average net price up through um, essentially the tuition freeze um, that, was, that was brought about by this board. And then you can see in the most recent and from the most recent year of data, this actual decline. So we saw on average an increase of 5.5% from 2011 to 2018, and then a 0% change um, looking at the past three years of data. This is incredible. And this commitment by the board, um, by our universities to really help um, make our universities as, as affordable as we can. However, it's important to note the second point on this slide, that the gap continues to narrow with our next most affordable in state. Now we know that, um, that, the, that the pandemic in particular has accelerated this already steeper decline among low and middle income students. And in fact, um, the proportion of our students from lower and middle income families has declined from 80% in 2011 to 70% in 2019. The percentage of our Pell recipients dropped to 32.6%, um, which is the lowest the state system has had. We typically have um, between 34 and 30%, 34 and 36% of our students are Pell eligible. So we continue to see this um, as a true mark of, of the work that's happening, the progress, but 
it continues to be a challenge and a moment for opportunity. Thank you. Trustee Bowers, thank you so much for commenting um, on this slide earlier. So this is the slide that, that really helps us understand what this impact is as we think about workforce. Um, as, you know, as we've identified the ability of linking post-secondary data to actual workforce data here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is very powerful. We're very thankful for our partnership with the Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry that allows us to link our data so we can see actual, actual impact. Um, so uh, this information is available on a public dashboard that takes you um, at the university level, at the program level as well, and allows you to see the percentage of our graduates working in PA and what their median earnings are. A very quick summary of that dashboard shows us that um, our state system graduates are working and living in Pennsylvania. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation earlier um, by Hershey Entertainment, talking about that commitment, talking about that relationship. And I think that that's very evident in that high percentage of our graduates working here in Pennsylvania. In terms of specific programs, as you may expect, our education graduates are most likely to work in Pennsylvania at 74%, and our STEM graduates are, are one of our lesser likely to work here in Pennsylvania at 66% working in Pennsylvania three years after graduation. Some other key groups really have higher um, labor participation rates after they graduate. These include our community college transfer students, our in-state students, and our Pell eligible students. Those students are all more likely to be working in Pennsylvania after graduation. Now this slide in particular notes the impact that, that our state system institutions have as a driver of social mobility. So up on the, as the graph goes up, you'll see those are PA annualized earnings five years after graduation. Along the bottom are the family income categories. On the far left, you have zero to 30,000. So it's the family income as those students come into our universities, all the way over to greater than 150,000 on the far right-hand side. The bar that you see, the, the black bar across, shows the average earning of high school graduates. And then each of the separate bars show the various breakouts of race ethnicity. So we saw this information in October um, to really begin to help us understand this impact. And being able to see this information, see what these variances look like specifically by race ethnicity among these income categories is, is exciting. And it really demonstrates the commitment um, of state system um, to the workforce in Pennsylvania. And as we think about the impact specifically along those um, that are low income and specifically those that are underrepresented minorities, three out of every four underrepresented, underrepresented minority students who came from a low income family had moved out of that low income status as an individual earner 10 years after graduation. So it's showing a huge movement um, of these particular students. Thank you. Um, this next section is really, really hoping to demonstrate um, what we're beginning to see on system financial health. Our universities are making very difficult decisions. These decisions are really necessary to help move themselves towards a point of sustainability. We have three metrics that we typically look at, two are, are here today. The third is in our public dashboard on our board of firm metrics that goes um, and shows information by university and by the system and how we're doing in terms of our university success and student success measures. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the annual primary reserve ratio. This shows that for every dollar of revenue a university receives, how much is left after operating expenses are made. For example, a positive operating margin creates a surplus which a university can save as part of their reserves. And an annual operating margin rate ratio of zero means that a university expended all of its revenues for operations in a given year and doesn't have any um, money left for reinvestment. The target for operating margin is two to 4%. Now, as you can see on this graph, you'll see the real slowdown um, starting in 2019 with the implementation of the sustainability policy, um, as well as the, the influx of some COVID relief funds, we're able to really stall this downward trajectory. I want you just to think back in your mind to 
um, to how we understand our enrollments. And we'll show this on the next slide and, the, and the, the linear trend that we are seeing there. This is really because of the efforts of our universities um, and how they were able to really anticipate some of these impacts um, and make those changes within their university. We still have a lot of work to do and the universities continue their commitment. Um, 11 universities right now fell below the target of 40% and that compares to six universities in 2015-16. On the right-hand side, we have the primary reserve ratio, and this shows how long a university um, could function and pay its obligations, including debt, without any additional revenues. The target, the target here is two to four percent. It looks like they may be backwards. So I apologize for that. Sorry, my slide's a little bit different. That's okay. Um, so the primary reserve. Nine fell below this target of 40 percent, um, and that was five in 2015-16. So again, as we're looking at that implementation of the sustainability policy in 2019 and seeing that real shift in the downward trajectory. University minimum reserves are that third metric, and so we're seeing a similar trend um, that we see within the annual primary reserve ratio. And so as we see that, we know that over eight of our universities do not meet that recommended threshold, including three that, that fall below the minimum required number of 90 days of operation. So there continues to be real movement, real growth opportunities. However, the overall trend is really showing some of the significant work um, that our universities have demonstrated and these hard decisions that they have had to make. So as we go into the next slide, I want you to think about this, about those financial slides and, and how specifically that curve is shifting as we look at specifically our enrollment. So this goes through um, 2021. Now, if I were to draw a linear line, you would see, or a line, you would see how incredibly linear it is looking at 2010 to even 2020. So this, this kind of trend um, that we were able to see um, really um, continues to have an impact on not just enrollments, um, but overall financial health as well. In 2021, we experienced a little bit more of a dip, um, which is really consistent with some of the national information that we see. So some of these key drivers that the chancellor mentioned in his remark, as well as some of the other discussions today are really um, our new freshmen, our low and middle income students, students from rural areas, and in particular that we're noting that we've seen nationally changes in our labor market that really impact students coming to our universities and, and did impact in fall of 2021. And so we know that, that the pandemic definitely accelerated this overall decline. But there's great news because as we begin to see evidence specifically through student success, marketing opportunities, um, we're seeing some real opportunities for student growth. These include traditional pipelines. Um, we've heard recapturing, uh, recapturing your backyard several times today and thinking about what that looks like within, within each of our university communities. Um, we can think about the low and middle income students. We referenced affordability earlier and talking about the real impact that has in those populations. I also wanna mention underrepresented minority um, students. The bottom, the little chart in the bottom shows the breakout of the minority population for our students, our employees and Pennsylvania as a whole. So you will see that um, in general, our minority population for, of our students is really reflective of the Commonwealth, but we still have some opportunity there within our employee population. And that's for both staff and for faculty. Now, and thinking about some great opportunity, some great news that we have as well is looking at our four-year cohort graduation rates. When you think about metrics related to student success, the first metric we typically reference is progression, uh, retention. So we will see that in the next slide. And then you have a four-year graduation rate, and then you have the standard, kind of the national standard six-year graduation rate, which gives students that 150% of time in order to graduate. So one of the first um, kind of graduation metrics that we're able to see is this four-year graduation trend. So through here, you can see the real incline. So look at the 2004 rate, which is in the bottom left-hand corner and then all the way out to 2015. These are cohort rates, meaning these students started at our universities at the number at the bottom. 
so all the way up through um, 2015. So those students were the last um, students to graduate prior to the pandemic. And you'll see that real change from just under 35% to 43.5% within that time period. Although our, our current rates are near the national average for public four-year institutions, this growth that we are seeing is over and above what we see nationally and is certainly something that we can celebrate. You can see in the last two bars, um, the decline to 42%, um, which really um, is also consistent with national information showing really the impact of the pandemic as we look at four-year cohort graduation rates. In addition um, to thinking about the four-year graduation rates, I mentioned earlier that the first thing that we really think about and the first time we're able to see movement in this area is for second year retention. So these bars are from 2010. So the students beginning first time as freshmen in fall of 2010, who were then returning in fall of 2011. The second set are for students coming in 2018 and returning in 19 and then students starting in 2019 and returning in fall of 2020, um, which you all will, will recall was the first year really, uh, the first fall that we saw impacts from the pandemic. The dark blue bar are state system universities and then followed by our national four-year public. And then the majority of our institutions fall under the master's comparison group. We have several institutions that do not, but just to show you kind of a marker of some comparable institutions. So you'll see that growth in particular in the national master's group over the past um, 10 years. And then you'll see that our institutions have, have uh, moved a little bit differently, however, have increased um, in the, specifically from fall 19 to fall 20. Preliminary data for the first year cohort um, for students returning in fall of 21 were down slightly, which is not only consistent with our overall enrollment information, but consistent with national data. However, we're seeing right now that our first time fall to spring data for the 21-22 school year um, really shows improvement um, really towards our, our, um, our pre-pandemic enrollment years. So it's exciting to be able to see this type of change, but when we're thinking about growth, this really represents an opportunity. You'll think back to those student markets that we're really looking at. So in addition to those new students, um, and recapturing our backyard, we can also really think about the retention efforts that are happening within our institutions. And we're really beginning to see some evidence and student persistence and graduation data that universities can, with focus, improve student outcomes. One area that's really um, of concern, but really an opportunity for growth is around underrepresented and Pell students. Universities were making a lot of progress in these areas, really beginning to close gaps um, for Pell eligible and for URM students, underrepresented minority students prior to the pandemic. However, progress as the pandemic began really stalled um, on closing the gap for those students. So this really represents an area that we have a lot of headroom, um, especially for these low income students and students of color, and especially at those universities where we're already challenged with enrollment. And the final slide that I wanna show you in thinking about metrics and thinking about the progress that we're making is really linking this information about our graduates and workforce and looking at our top areas of study. So um, this area, the growth opportunity in programs feeding high demand occupations is really apparent in this graph. These are our top three areas of graduates. If you'll also think about the occupational demand information, these are right in line with that. So business, health professions and STEM. And you'll see an increase in credentials um, from 2010-11 to 2020-21. Um, and then you'll also see at the bottom of health professions and STEM that increase in certificates being awarded as well, not just um, undergraduate students, which are the Navy pieces and graduate students in the gold. So this really demonstrates that our universities are responsive programmatically to student and employer needs but also that we need to do more quickly to reduce redundancy, expand the breadth of offerings within some of these high demand fields. Thank you guys so much for, for staying with us during the data conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, and so I, I want to challenge you all in, um, to, to continue to look at these metrics 
Um, we've expanded that transparency, offering various dashboards on our public facing website. And then I also want to thank our universities um, and for their institutional research directors and offices as well. Without them providing this information centrally, without that partnership, we wouldn't be able to see these long time trends. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, uh, Kate. Really appreciate that. And, and now, um, we're going to hear from Molly Mercer, who's uh, our chief financial officer. This is uh, directly related to this conversation because Kate talked about uh, uh, the, these metrics not only showing some good progress um, on uh, uh, major metrics that we care about, both with regard to um, universities' uh, financial situations, but with regard to um, student enrollment. Um, and Molly is going to follow it up with a report on how we've been um, using uh, the one-time funds uh, that have been provided to us um, by the state, uh, all of which are in furtherance, right, of these goals, and, and we'll continue uh, to turn these opportunities, I, I think, into reality. Um, let me say what Dan has said um, and what we continue to say also, which is just a huge thank you uh, to the Commonwealth, uh, to the state legislature, um, to, the, to the governor, um, to advocates on this board, right, who talk to all those important people. Uh, <coughs> we cannot stress enough how much we believe that this is a partnership and you can entrust us to uh, use, uh, use these funds utmost to these uh, direct um, and data-driven outcomes. So Molly, let me turn it over to you now. Great, thank Follow you. Up. So we can head to the first slide and, and I'll just echo that and just say that these funds have been really instrumental in supporting the changes that we are pursuing as a system with integration, with strengthening student recruitment and retention practices. Let's go to the pie slide. They're helping launch our workforce development projects, our DEI investments, as well as undertake our student single uh, student university information system. So collectively, you'll see the funds on the right reflect our student success oriented funds. And I'll step through in a moment how those are distributed out and discuss a little bit about the focal areas and the outcomes associated with those. If you look to the left of the pie, these are funds that support primarily our sustainability and transformational work. These include funds for steps we took in July to better align universities to the enacted appropriation formula. They're gonna be a source to support labor transitions associated with the sustainability steps. They will provide much needed debt relief and they will support our integrating universities with their implementation and their startup costs. Next slide. So the bi-university breakout of the distributed components of those student success areas are shown here. And they're really reflective of Decisions reached collaboratively between the presidents and the chancellor, the ELG really vetted and determined together how to distribute out these dollars. In large part, the distributions align pretty closely with the allocation formula. However, with enrollment and student success dollars, the decision was made to weight a, a little more heavily universities who did experience steeper enrollment drops this past fall really giving them a boost um, towards the efforts that they, they need and desire to make for the upcoming year's recruitment. Universities are deploying these funds now to make impact in their most important focal areas. The presidents, they've identified discrete initiatives that they have been ready to pursue, and they really can now that funding's available to support them. Next slide. So as I said, the universities have outlined their investments across each area, and you can see them again reiterated here. The student success funds that you see in blue, they're addressing needs really across this, the life cycle of the student experience, which you heard a lot about yesterday as well. All of that collectively um, contributes to enrollment, including student recruitment, student affordability, and student progression. There's examples here you can see of specific items. And I wanna note that the universities also have identified outcomes for each of these in a way that measurement and follow-up assessment can take place, including you know, areas such as targeted outcomes to grow either new enrollment or retention, either overall or focused on specific student segments. 
The DEI funds, they're covering a multitude of investments, including mentoring, assessment of campus climate, preparedness programs, diversification of curriculum, and efforts to um, enhance workforce recruitment. Workforce development encompasses infrastructure to more seamlessly support that student experience and non-degree credentialing, increased marketing, piloting new programs, and those are just a few examples. And lastly, the OneSys investment will really enable both enhancements and collaboration across the system as universities advance that IT system that's really the backbone of the student experience. Next slide. So taking a look at the distribution of funding across the board, I'm gonna loop back and just cover briefly the areas of funding I mentioned in the beginning, those sustainability and transformational funds. The appropriation adjustments through the use of SERS dollars that the board approved in July are reflected there. Debt relief to the West is allocated, and we've discussed that uh, as well when we're reviewing integration work. Integration support, you can see that's mostly assigned to a region, but there are some shared costs across both areas. And then lastly, labor transition dollars will be allocated as applicable and as needed, and those specifics will be known as we progress later into this fiscal year. So tying these funds together with the student success oriented funds that I just went through, just really gives you that full picture of, of how we are allocating the 75 million. And again, I'll just reiterate that these funds have been really instrumental to implementing priorities that we've had in mind for some time and really helping us pursue the changes that will be most helpful for us as a system. So that concludes my overview and happy to take any questions. Okay, any questions? Anyone on Zoom, Randy? And board members on Zoom, you can click raise hand if you have any questions. And Madam Chair, can I just uh, remind board members that the goals that um, Molly mentioned for the is, are included in your packet um, and that we'll also be circulating this information if we haven't already. Well, of course, we will be circulating it to the General Assembly where there has been some interest. Yeah, I also um, in included our... Uh, even more detailed break breakdowns, I believe. Right? That's uh, correct. Mm -hmm. Of each initiative. Of each, yeah. right, exactly. And I want to one comment on that. I think it may be worth making. So you know, you'll look through the list. And you'll say, God, this has been distributed quite far and wide on initiatives. And the the logic that we use within the executive leadership group, and and you know, a, a kudos, shout out to my colleagues for the process, which um, was I thought really good and 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 um, resulted in, in good outcomes was really about using uh, state funds, the federal dollars, to amplify and accelerate investments that are already being made at the university. So we, we agreed what the objectives were, retention, enrollment, et cetera, uh, DI objectives, and then and then really turned to the universities and said, okay, what's how, how can you achieve those objectives given the work that you're already doing? And so this way the federal dollars are actually leveraging um, expenditures that are already being made. So that explains the wide range of initiatives that's uh, available. Good. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, again, directly <laughs> related, uh, we're going to talk about the allocation formula, get an update on where we stand um, in that process. So let me turn this over now to uh, Larry Skinner, who's chair of the University Success Committee uh, in in, in which this resides. Larry? Yes, good morning, everybody. I believe that uh, it's going to be Molly that's gonna to continue to uh, uh, take this conversation to the rest of the board. I do wanna thank all of the presidents and all the other people that have been involved in working so diligently to make this something that's gonna work for us moving forward. Okay, yeah, Mike, we're gonna hear from you, right? Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Mr. Chair. I'm actually going to speak uh, and Molly's gonna correct me when I make a mistake, <laughs> which is a good system usually. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, let's go to the next slide um, as I talk a little bit about the scope of the work of a work group that is, is, has been put together to develop um, and propose to the board ultimately uh, a new uh, performance, or, or pardon me, appropriation allocation formula. Um, 
the the task needs to be appropriately defined, and that is that the um, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania provides a certain amount of appropriation each fiscal year to support the education and general budgets of the system and its universities. Um, and that pie is allocated via the mechanism of this formula. This is not about capital funding. It's not about fundraising. It's not about other sources of funds, but it's really about that. And it's about appropriately allocating the funds, carving up that pie to support the goals of the system and the universities therein. It's not about making the pie larger, something that we all care about and would work on in other, other uh, fora, and all of us are engaged in that for various good reasons, but it really is about doing the best job with the funds that the Commonwealth is generous enough to provide in service of the mission of the institution. In 2014, the board adopted a um, allocation formula that was used for several years. And then um, in 2018-19, the um, board made some direct decisions about how to allocate funds that were not completely in line with that 2014 formula, but rather addressed some things related to specific circumstances at the time as we were starting to come to grips with the, some of the challenges the system and the universities were facing. Um, we are looking at a new approach here, and this slide helps to illustrate that. So if you were to look at the um, framework section of this slide, you would see going from a formula and uh, other allocations that are based on university costs and moving to, in this new uh, allocation formula, something that is absolutely driven by enrollment. So dollars need to go where the students are. It's more complicated than that simple statement, and there are more slides to talk about that. Also, we're focused on student success, which has come up several times, which is a key goal of the system, of course, and of all of us. And we're going from taking some money off the top, which that 2014 formula did, and running it through a fairly complex set of, of criteria and sometimes changing goals to actually putting the success of our students as part of the basic mechanism for allocating the appropriation. So making sure that enrollment, getting students in, enrolling them, supporting them, and supporting them through just being successful is key part of, of how we allocate every single dollar of that appropriation. Also added in the sort of new column of this uh, slide is the idea of one-time funding. And we just talked about that, and Molly just talked about how some of those one-time funds from the ARP have been invested and are being invested at the universities in significant conversation with each other. So we can learn from each other. If we find a great practice, we can start to move that into the base funding, if you will, that is allocated by the uh, formula. But we're blessed with the opportunity to um, um, actually experiment, try some things, try to extend what we're doing to show results, and then we can fold that back in, and that's really reflected there. Let's go ahead to the next slide, please. I, I think it's important, and certainly the work group has taken it as important to keep in mind the mission of the system that's come up in the chair's comments today and at several points in the data and other places in our discussion. We're here to drive that workforce development, social mobility, for the people and for the Commonwealth to meet the needs of our industry, to make sure the economy is strong and that our residents have a chance to participate in that, that economy. Um, there are several priorities or opportunities, and I think actually we've touched on these in several places, uh, most of them. Um, we wanna make sure that those student groups that may need additional support, that may be underrepresented in our current populations of students are supported and we connect the dots so they have a pipeline into the great experience that's provided by the state system universities. Students in these groups might include underrepresented minorities, it might include those lower income students, families uh, coming from families with lower income. Again, things that have been mentioned by the chancellor in his remarks, it's what we're about. We need to make sure that there's a pathway. You can imagine other possibilities here. We've listed a few community college transfers, working with our partners in the community colleges, uh, veterans um, and their families and others. We can just imagine that. And I will ask for some comments from board members uh, as we go through this today 
about those areas that seem most important to you. That's going to provide some guidance to the work group as we put the, the more detailed pen to paper. We want to make sure that we're connecting to strong demand for programs and high demand occupations, again, something mentioned already. We need to make sure we're investing our funds to help students be successful, as indicated by that student retention line here, paying particular attention to those groups of students that have shown historically attainment gaps. They're not doing as well as the baseline, if you will. We need to make sure we so shore them up as part of our student success work. And we certainly want to look at other markets for students Bottom line is, as, as we've talked about for some time with sustainability policy, we have to do that in a way that's sustainable for the institutions and for the system. Let's go to the next slide. So here's getting to the conceptual framework for this new formula. I'm not gonna show you numbers today that say, here's how many dollars IUP gets. If the board would like to vote today that IEP gets them all, we'll be happy to have that go forward, but that's not what it's about today. It's about getting the right concepts in place to drive us toward our goals as a system, as a university. And then the committee, the work group will go back and dig in to doing some of that detail work. And that's, that's coming in the future. So what the bar across the middle of this slide says is that um, the appropriation would be allocated almost completely, substantially, based on enrollment. So if I were to use my simple example that some of you have heard before, making up a few numbers here, every single student who's enrolled in, this, in a university in the state system, that university in which they're enrolled would get $4,000 of appropriation. And again, 4,000 is a made up number. But then what about those students in those priority groups? Let's talk about students maybe from underrepresented minorities who have additional challenges to overcome, may need additional support, or, and we want to particularly incentivize their success right now. So let's add another $500 for every student in that group who's enrolled at a university. So a university might get $4,500 for that particular student, layering on that priority. And similarly, we can talk about um, progress toward degree as a student moves from a lower division first couple of years of, of their undergraduate into the upper division, the junior and senior years, they've made some progress, they're succeeding. Let's recognize that, really incentivize the universities to get students to that point by adding a few more dollars, a couple hundred more, 500 more to that 4,000 or 4,500 for a student that's, that's there. So we're giving additional dollars to recognize, to support, and encourage universities, not that we don't all think about this, but to encourage universities to move those students toward success. And then the degree level enrollment, I want to point out specifically is, is an example. It, it takes a different amount of effort to educate a student at the undergraduate level, at the master's level, at the doctoral level. We want to think about that as we fund universities to provide, for example, more master's graduates to meet some of the workforce needs at those levels. And so that's to recognize that a master's student might result in additional dollars going to the university for that master's student. 4,000 plus an underrepresented minority plus a student from that group that's in a, in a master's program. Maybe that's another uh, $5,000 total, 4,000 plus 500 plus 500 again, something like that. Th again, don't take those numbers to the bank, colleagues don't spend them yet, but it's really just to give you a feel for what we're thinking about here. Um, what, what we found from the national research is that if you put the sort of student success uh, aside in a separate bucket, you end up with the potential for gaming that and you end up not actually achieving the objectives that you might wish to achieve. So by folding it in all to the same system, we're hopeful that that will encourage, incentivize, recognize the um, goals that the board would set and also will provide the additional support, fund the additional support that some students need to be successful. There's a key question I think buried in here for the board and we'd love to hear from you. What groups of students do you think we should be focused on? How should we think about student success? Just generally to hear from you, uh, your thoughts to help guide the, the work group in its next steps for getting uh, um, the more detailed stuff in front of you for approval later. Um, I, I would say that it's important not to 
um, diffuse the investment across so, so many groups that we end up not having the impact we wish. So focusing for impact is something that I have sort of emblazoned in my, in my brain around this topic. We could have every, every single student group you might imagine be special, and they all are, but we need to focus to get to where the board needs to be. So please don't tell us we need 30 groups, I guess is what I'm saying. Give us a couple areas that are of focus. Let's go to the next slide and, and um, talk a little bit more. The gray bar here really represents that enrollment component, the one that's every, every student results in a university getting so many dollars and modified as on the previous slide, the focus areas for students. The 2014 formula included a, a relatively small, what's called here fixed cost number, although they weren't really fixed, they were connected to the basic cost of operating a university. They weren't a uh, multiple of the number of students served. So there has to be a library, you have to turn the lights on, you, you have to get things started. And so there was a component that was just this many dollars goes to an institution every institution to make sure that they can they can do the basic operation. Then on top of that, you build the significant, much more significant component of the funding by multiplying each student by whatever dollar per student. Um, everybody has fixed costs. They vary by location. They vary by um, enrollment size. You can imagine that, that the overhead, if you will, of having a library is a little different per student at a smaller university than at a larger university. Um, Another key thing is that enrollments can go up and down in a significant way from year to year, referred to on the slide as wild swings of enrollment, and that really can happen. And so having that fixed component, or again, that sort of um, just dollars that you know you're gonna have can help buffer some of those ups and downs from year to year a little bit and make it much easier to operate across the multiple years it takes for students to get through the program and, and, and graduate. Um, here's a, the question for the board, second question really is, should we try to include a fixed cost component as part of the total here, or would you rather not have anything that looks like a fixed component and have it all driven by enrollment? We can deal with some of the concerns I mentioned about variability and the cost of turning the lights on. Through the enrollment driven component, it gets a little less clear what we're doing with that, a little less transparency is possible, but it is possible to do that. Let's do the next slide. I'm almost done, I promise. Um, the, and, and actually the, the 2014 formula include not just that, what I referred to as fixed cost, but it also included a component that differed by university based on mission, potentially on context. So the simple example is at the time, IUP was the only doctoral research university in the system. Costs a bit more to run a doctoral research university than Anybody else here except now Westchester? Um, no, not about you guys, but it really does. You can look at the national data and see that there's a difference in base cost. And so IUP was getting a little more because it was a doctoral research university. Similarly, Cheney is the only HBCU, historically black college university in the system that costs a little more based on national data. So that was a, a little higher, an additional mission component was there. Might also point out that being in a big city versus being in a rural area changes some of the context for a university. And so the work group has wondered if we wanted to use that to recognize some of those differences. And finally, in the middle of the integration process, we know that there are gonna be some changing costs for our integrating um, universities. This might be a place to recognize that context, knowing that we would likely see that that amount decline over time as things settle out and things get sorted out. So that's the, and the, here's the third question for you to comment on. Would you like us to think about and, and explore including such a component in the overall um, uh, allocation formula? All right, next slide. This is just a, a picture of where we are in the process. We are in February. In fact, we are on February 3rd, which points to item three, um, where we're, um, talking to you about the general approach, some of the ideas here and getting feedback from the board. In the last few weeks, we've received feedback from the executive leadership group, the ELG, 
from the executive committee of the board, from the chief academic officers, from the chief financial officers, and then also with the university success committee last week. And that's sharpened our, our thoughts going forward. What we need from you today is some comments, some thoughts from you about where we should address these three questions. What are key focus groups we wanna put priority on for our students? How do we wanna think about the um, um, potential, again, fixed costs, not quite fixed costs, but not enrollment um, sensitive items for basic operations and the potential of a mission or context driven one? What do you think about that? Then the work group will get back on it and start to put more detail and, and, and more flesh on the bones as we target coming back to you after some review by various groups in the April meeting for you to look at something that's much more detailed so you can start to understand that and hopefully take action on that perhaps at that meeting. And then by the time we get to the July actual allocation, we would put the details together so you'd actually have policy and procedure framework so you could move ahead and actually use it going into the next fiscal year. All right, I think I better take a breath and turn it back to the chair of our committee. I think uh, Governor Skinner is, is, is running the show. So I've, I've set, talked as fast as I can, Larry, and um, I, I think I'll turn it back to you now. Uh, are there any additional, are there any questions uh, from the group about the uh, allocation changes that were uh, just spoken about by Michael? I, I have um, a couple questions or comments. Please. If, if I could. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, ex excellent work. I, I really do appreciate it. And what I really appreciate is the um, transparency in coming back to the board, sort of presenting this kind of, uh, you know, here are the series of options and, and here are the considerations. Um, and, you know, really rather than telling us what to do, turning it back to us because this is really a, a, a huge policy uh, consideration uh, for, for us as the board. Uh, so I so I really appreciate not only the amount of work that's gone into this, but but the approach. Um, it's uh, it recognizes a partnership and a, and a real collegiality. So uh, so thank you, Mike, and your team and Larry um, for that. You know, Mike, this is my third time through this and um, the presentation gets better and better and it gets sort of more on target and more you know, focused around things we've been talking about, which makes me sort of continue to evolve my own thinking. Um, and I'm gonna make some comments completely couched in, 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 the, in the caveat that uh, these are only comments right now, and we have time to continue thinking about this and talking about this um, and iterating this. Um, uh, and I've certainly, you know, been, been known to learn and grow and change and evolve. So I, I'm not saying anything here to lock either myself in or anybody else. Um, so uh, I, I think that, um, first of all, I'm going to check with Randy to make sure that we're okay to be yep. discussing like this and we Absolutely. don't have to move out, yep. Madam into, Chair, uh, you're, out of a committee mode or we're anything. We're not in a committee mode where you're, you can moderate the okay. meeting from here. All right, fine. I just, you know, I always have to look at Andy and Randy. That's right. Sure. And I've, I've got, if you want to make a comment, just connect with me and I'll put you on the speakers okay. list. We have some on the Zoom already. Okay, great. Um, all right. So anyway, you know, sort of bottom line of what I'm thinking is the, the more I think about this and the more I see this, uh, the more I think this is an opportunity to really use this for ourselves um, uh, to uh, show our commitment um, to phase three and the goals around phase three. And so, first of all, that makes me think that although I know there's um, a lot of literature that says that 100% performance-based allocation formulas do not always result in the outcomes one would hope. Um, you know, if there are ways to think about that as a concept and, and better do ours, it's something I want to put on the table. Because this is it. This is all we've got, right? To, to really uh, try to ourselves, put ourselves in a position where as a board, we're making policy and incentivizing um, our universities uh, to um, 
you know, to 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 reach the outcomes and the the uh, the goals and the metrics that uh, that we feel are important. So I, I just want to say that as a general concept. That's why I'm I'm sort of less excited about talking about this in terms of you know what about fixed costs do we do we set aside? Um, and I, I that probably is not greeted with a whole lot of um, uh, you know welcoming <laughs> right by uh, university, you, you know, the university presidents, I, I certainly understand that. And as I say, these, these are just my thoughts. Um, but this is a board opportunity to support uh, uh, very strongly um, this uh, phase three of, of redesign uh, that we're trying to move in the direction of. So, you know, I, so I just want to say that. The only other thing I will say is that I agree with you, Mike. And this also has to do with fixed costs. Once you look at that and you start to look at, well, you know, different universities have different models or are in different states of need, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the extent to which we don't dilute this opportunity with this formula, I, I, I think is also sort of a second like framework for us to be thinking about this. Let's not dilute this chance. Let's not Think about all the things, you know, everything is worthy. Um, but uh, if we stay focused on the idea um, that that this is a policy, actually, this is a policy moment for us, um, I, I think we'll be better served in, in this deliberation. Great. Next, we have Senator Schwenk and Senator Martin. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. And, and uh, Chairwoman Shapiro, I couldn't agree with you more in terms of the, the framework that you set for how this can possibly work. Um, to me, the first first to, to compliment um, the committee that worked on this, in all my years on the board, I have never seen such a, a focused effort to look at our goals and every aspect of it. Um, to, to make sure that we can achieve them. So I, I, I really commend you for you know, this, this more student-centered, which we have said, that's what we're going to be about. And for this approach, I think, I think it's great. Um, couple of uh, questions. In terms of what has been done already, um, Dr. Driscoll, how much faculty and staff and student input has there, has there been? What kind of thought process or how have they been engaged in this? And then two, this is such a sea change from, to me, from what we have done in the past. How will we evaluate this? How will we know if it's working? And how long will it take? Because these are, you know, these are things that aren't measured in terms of three months, right? I'll, I'll end there and ask you to respond. Thank you. I, I think that several of us appreciate your recognition of the time scale on, on some of this, uh, Senator Frank. Frank. Um, we, we have not had broad consultation with the other groups that you've mentioned. I think that's a good question for you to raise. And I think I'll take that back to the work group to make sure that by the time we get back to you in April, we've had a chance to consult with those. Certainly um, um, key, key stakeholders, it's a little early maybe, but as we get guidance today, I think it will be helpful to do that. I think the evaluation um, 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 question is something we need to fold into our next round as well, but it's, it has been something we've discussed. It really does connect to the specific measures we want to put in place around, let's say, student success. Obviously, enrollment is one of those, but I, the, your time scale question is an important one. We can show incremental progress. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to happen, uh, you know, on um, um, January one of 2023 when we allocate, when you allocate the appropriation, you know, uh, in July of 22. So I think we should, we we owe you a little bit more in terms of some of the detail, including the the other details we owe you about how we might look at that as we go forward. So I, I appreciate both the questions, which help define some of the other things we need to work on. So thank you. Sure, and I, I appreciate that response and look forward to it. Um, I, I worry that we this is so different. We need to stay the course for a period of time to make sure, you know, that we are on the right track. Um, 
and when do we when do we change direction if if necessary but i i like the concept and appreciate the way that you've the allocations the way you've talked about it so far thank you thank you next we have senator martin and then secretary garcia Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mike, for the presentation and all the hard work you guys are doing. I, I, I think we're definitely moving um, in a much healthier direction. Um, I guess three, just three things just to you, maybe get some further detail on. Um, first is how do you feel in terms of is this really finding a, a sweet spot between enrollment, which is obviously an important metric, uh, important factor, uh, but also for performance and outcomes? Do you feel that this could move more in that direction? I mean, I, I, I asked from the standpoint of, it's one thing to get them in the door for the first year, it's another if you're keeping them, and it's even better if they graduate. Um, can you talk about that a little bit first? And I'll, I'll pause before asking a second question. Thank, thank you, Senator Martin. The, I, I think that this is um, um, significantly moving in the direction of explicitly connecting the funding with goals for those specific populations and for student success. The devil is a little bit in the details, but the board already has approved metrics for things like that, that you've, you've looked at in, in previous years. And, and the work group's thinking is how do we draw in the right subset of those board approved metrics to determine some of the allocations that would come for those targeted um, 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 areas beyond just every student, of course, deserves to uh, see some of that appropriation affect them. So that really is, is I think, an important direct connection with goals, expectations, and the funding that comes with those. Now, I would say that, that on, on behalf of my colleagues, that, that all of us care about these goals and work on these goals as, as do our staff on a regular basis. It's important to talk maybe at the same time about incentivizing and recognizing um, achievement, um, achieving of outcomes, while we talk about recognizing that, that achieving some of those outcomes does require additional funding to, to provide the additional support around students to help them be successful. What, what I would say is that we're, we're fortunate in, in this model that's in front of you that we can talk about both of those things being the impacts of the approach here. So if, if that made sense, both of those things are important, incentivizing toward clear goals, but also recognizing that some investment, I guess I would say is needed to achieve those goals. And, and both of those would be reflected and recognized in the mechanism here. And you had more questions. So. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate that because I, I think the whole, the whole incentivizing and what we're incentivizing to with our investment um, as the, uh, the Higher Education Funding Commission starts to uh, get rolling. I know that's one of the biggest topics I hear about uh, in terms of things I know at least the General Assembly wants to, to look at in the, with this commission. Um, the second part was, um, I, I believe it was in relation to uh, incentivizing with more funding per student. You said you wanted to get uh, input from the board. Um, it didn't really delve into what what would be the incentivizing when you say subsections or subsets or or different individuals what what exactly are we getting at in terms of what would qualify for more student funding per um, there are a few examples on the slide and and I, they're not um unthoughtful, I guess, in, in their presentation. But if we want to recognize the changing demographics of the Commonwealth and focus on improving the results, improving increasing enrollment from underrepresented groups, that would be an example of an area where we could say, we want to do something for underrepresented students and let's make those a priority area for some additional funding in, in one of those. If we wanted to provide additional support to students who move closer to their degree, that would be another place. And those are a couple that were mentioned. If we wanted to incentivize successful transfer from community colleges to universities, we can do that by providing some funds focused on students, additional funds beyond the base amount to students who were to transfer in after receiving their associate's degree from, from a, a community college. Those are just three examples that are slightly different um, 
that may help help clarify that, Senator. And Mike, can I? Uh, yeah, please. I mean, um, you know, I think one of the things we're trying to be thoughtful about, and uh, maybe mangled it in my opening remarks, the, 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 there are growth opportunities, and we need to take advantage of them in order to, um, you know, really meet the state's credentialing needs. We just focus there. Those growth opportunities tend to be with student groups who, who just need more support and who can't pay our price. It, it just is what it is. It's a math problem. That, the, 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 that in order to, to meet the state's economic development need, we're just going to have to do better, not just Pennsylvania state system, but higher education generally. Um, uh, not just getting students from um, uh, a variety of uh, underserved groups into uh, our universities, but also, you know, uh, have them succeed there. And as we, uh, uh, you know, we are aware that first generation students who lack the family supports that, that um, a, a non first generation student has in terms of helping to navigate uh, college or uh, students who come you know, and are not quite as academically prepared uh, as others, or um, uh, you know, students who have financial challenges. Um, they just, they, we need to figure out how to support them, and and we have to uh, address the fact that they may actually, uh, we, we we may actually have to throw more support. They may cost more to educate well, if I can put it bluntly. And so that's what we're trying to work through. We're trying to identify where the target growth opportunities are, and then what the cost of being able to deliver on them are being very thoughtful of our students. The worst thing that we could possibly do is engage a whole bunch of students into our universities and then not provide the support to enable them to succeed. And then they go away having inherited debt, um, you know, through loans, et cetera, but not actually attaining their degrees. So we're trying to tie enrollment strategies and um, understanding about what the cost of student success is for those strategies, a very highly segmented approach to thinking about the student marketplace. Mike, can I put a layer on that for one second? Uh, I want to try to make what Dan's saying incredibly concrete. Uh, a first gen student, for example, needs uh, uh, in all likelihood greater help with the FAFSA, greater help with navigating our structures and systems because they don't have parents who can explain it to them in, an, in a natural way. And so that means that we need to hire staff in order to serve those, those folks. And in some, some, in many cases, have to provide greater financial aid. If there is not some sort of a multiplier for those students, while we have an ethical uh, and, and, a, and a real moral incentive for, for working with those students, there's actually a built-in financial disincentive. So I actually don't see it as incentivizing. I actually see it as removing a financial disincentive just by making us whole for, the, for those additional services we need so that we can provide effective services for, for a greater variety of students. And one, la one last point, again, is, is that, you know, it's interesting, I was talking to Governor Smith a moment ago, you know, the, the higher education ecosystem is a very interesting and complex place in the state of Pennsylvania. But there are not that many places that are geared towards this broad student group as the Pennsylvania state system and, frankly, the community college. And, you know, they, they just aren't. There's just not the seats at other institutions. And so if we're going to meet those workforce numbers, we have to do it, A, with these groups. We have to do better by these student groups. And B, we have to do it where there's capacity and capability. And we have to recognize um, the level of support it's going to require um, in order to, to achieve that objective, we're going to have to somehow figure out a way to um, find additional support for the universities that serve those populations. Uh, I, I appreciate that. So um, I definitely love to be able to uh, engage the task force more on some of that and talk about economically disadvantaged or veterans or whomever else are out there and, and find out if this is going to be a moving target year after year or how things are adjusted based on numbers, depending on where the institutions are and what that institution means to the community. So I, I think there's other things I'd, I'd like, like to hear about and also talk to some of the other presidents who were involved in the process too. Yeah. But thank you for the presentation, it was great. And just to build on that point, you know, I think where we're moving um, and uh, is to a place where we can be clear at both the university and the system level of precisely on those, um, precisely to that point, what where do we see growth happening? What students do we expect to be serving through what program areas, et cetera? Um, getting clearer and clearer in our, our the goals that we you know uh, present to one another and to the board um, so we can have those conversations. 
We have uh, Secretary Garcia, then Representative Roy. Thank you. Uh, one of the uh, things I've been uh, honored to have uh, been able to do in my career is to really study uh, the ways in which um, states have built up their state data systems in order to, uh, you know, uh, funnel appropriations and other state funds to institutions of higher education. And so uh, to Senator Martin's point, um, that uh, linkage between enrollment and outcomes is, is one of the, the innovations, so to speak, in how uh, systems and states are you know, equipping themselves to really see students through to graduation that um, is a common feature of many modern uh, funding formulas. And so I, I completely concur that, that um, and uh, you know, greatly support that linkage between enrollment and outcomes that President Driscoll mentioned. And it's a, uh, it's a must have you know, uh, element of any allocations uh, you know, in, in the society we live in today. The other point I wanted to make has to do with the uh, the <clears throat> the it might seem unusual to focus a funding formula allocation on enrollment, but for PASHI to be uh, focusing on that aspect at this point in time is really a reflection of uh, their being able to return to the enrollment levels that existed more than a decade ago. And so I really see uh, enrollment being a very good uh, uh, use of how these dollars are spent uh, because that's, uh, you know, we have a responsibility to really help uh, all the communities in the PASHI system to uh, enroll. Uh, members of their communities who may not have engaged in post-secondary education previously, maybe those who at one point attempted to earn a post-secondary credential but were unable to uh, due to you know, some of these uh, basic needs and securities that have been highlighted yesterday and today. And so I really wanted to uh, uh, applaud the, the efforts of this work group in uh, you know, returning the PASHI system to the enrollment levels that it enjoyed prior because we really, really need more healthcare professionals, more educators, more you know, businesses and entrepreneurs in the rural areas uh, in, at which some of the colleges uh, um, uh, reside in. And, and so, um, Going back to a question that President Driscoll mentioned in his presentation, the, I completely agree that there cannot be a, a laundry list of uh, student uh, groups that are uh, supported through this allocation or through this change in the formula. At the same time, I was wondering if the work group has discussed uh, the ability of each a uh, state system institution to really define who, wh what their groups are because there are great variations in local, regional, uh, you know, community compositions across many uh, of these demographic groups that I think should inform, uh, especially when you look at the individuals in your community that are of working age that are, not, are low income or middle income or, or were when they were younger. And I think that that should be, it, has that been discussed, uh, you know, to have some customization uh, that really takes into account local regional demographic um, characteristics, even as we, you know, um, uh, enable you know, a system-wide you know, uh, effort around the identification of those groups. I, 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 Secretary Garcia, I appreciate that, that thought. 
which hadn't been explicitly discussed in the work group at that level of let's look at a priority student group and think about that, not just in the whole, but, but look at how that might be different for each university. We've talked about context a bit in some ways, but not with that spe specificity. And so I really appreciate that. And we'll, we'll talk about that again. There are a number of areas in which the board and the system wanna make progress. Each university might contribute to that total progress in slightly different ways based on their circumstances. And so I think that's a really useful comment for us as we, we get into our next round of thinking. So thank you. And we have uh, Representative Roy and then Governor Walter. Okay, thank you. Uh, w w when I think about what the, what the state did, what we did, it was probably in 2016, probably we passed, the legislature passed a fair funding formula for K through 12 education. And uh, we applied that to increases in state funding. We didn't wanna you know, shock any school district too much by completely you know, redoing how the state funding for basic ed funding is distributed to the 500 school districts. So it's, it's being phased in very slowly. Now, some people say it's not being phased in quickly enough, but whatever we do, I just think we need to gradually phase it in. That, that would probably happen anyways, but we don't want some school, some university to lose, you know, 10 or 20 or 30% of their mo state money all at once. Uh, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, with enrollment, I think we use a three-year average for uh, K through 12 public school districts. So if, if the number of students is gonna be a key factor in how we do this, you know, maybe we should consider doing a, you know, three-year average enrollment. And that way, when there's little peaks and valleys, it wouldn't impact things as much. But but in the, you know, fair funding formula for K through 12, you know, the number of students, three-year average, uh, that's a big factor of it. The number of students in poverty, and we kind of have that information from knowing how many students at each university get, you know, Pell Grants, uh, you know, non-English speaking students. So there's factors like that. So, you know, maybe everyone, including myself, should take a look at what we did with K through 12 with the fair funding formula. And that might kind of give us some guidance because that passed, I believe it was unanimous in the House and Senate. So, you know, it wasn't really considered controversial. Controversial. There's widespread agreement when something passes like that. So that's, that's just a couple observations. Thanks. Representative Roy, I, I appreciate uh, both the observations and the experience. Um, and, and the board has already taken some steps to adjust allocation of appropriation with the current year. And I just wanna mention that because things were somewhat disconnected from the enrollment swings. And so you've buffered some of that with some of the one-time funds as you've done some reductions. So that's not unlike what you're describing, I, I think in some important ways. And, and to your point about suddenly changing a, a, a individual universities appropriation in, in, in a, a major way, I, I think that we would recognize and all the board recognizes that if we're implementing this in, in July, as you make your decisions, you're doing that after a fiscal year has already started and many decisions about the year ahead have already been made and so on. And so the, the, the work group will think about it. It's part of our overall charge, how we get to the point we need to get to while still paying attention to that need to phase in in some fashion. We have to balance that with the need that we need to, uh, that we clearly have uh, an imperative, I think, to move quickly in making some of the changes as we continue to move ahead. So I, I appreciate both those comments and they'll help the work group think through things as well. And while I, I'm not sure I wanna read everything that was ever done with K-12 funding in, in, in Pennsylvania, I think it's a good point that we might wanna look at some of those factors and from that prior work. Thank you. Governor Walder, then Governor Smith. I just wanna thank the board for fantastic conversations that have been going on and like an excellent presentation. I've been learning more and more as we talk about it. But I wanna throw to the board the perspective um, coming from a student and I can't speak for my other student board members, but as a student, I've realized that since the pandemic, a lot of 
students, not just in Pashi, just across the country, forgot to do school. They forgot how to go to class. They forgot how to balance their time and management. The spike of specifically mental health rose as the pan pandemic progressed. And as we're returning to more in-person and normal quote unquote times, we still need to adapt. I've learned adaptability is one of the key factors, how we're getting transitioning out of, we're in mass social distancing, um, but I don't know anything about numbers. Don't ask me about numbers, but <laughs> with this allocation formula, I'm seeing more intrigue. I'm interested to see um, how the fixed costs can play a role for student success, because that's, that's why we're here, for student success. So why don't we think about, depending on the universities, like what type of resources are we providing outside of the classroom for students? So whether it's counseling or just career readiness resources, because I've seen the different changes that have been made in students' lives of like, I need to find the balance between like working a job or um, providing, yeah, providing that financial stability for me to go, get an education um, or just like life in general. Like we have so many things going on in our individual lives that we, we, some, we, we some, it's sometimes forget like, okay, we're in college. This is, we're supposed to be learning. We're supposed to be growing. And then that ultimately like kind of makes me think of like colleges. Yes. College is about getting an education, getting a degree, but it's also about getting that growth of making me the person I am to be ready for the workforce. Um, th thanks for that input. That That's valuable. And I, I think all of us that are, are at universities recognize the additional challenges that our students have seen. And we see the direct impact in areas like counseling centers and um, food insecurity has been mentioned several times today and, and the, the level of demand for additional support there. And so it, it would be interesting. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about how that fixed cost component is more clearly identified should we, we come forward with that as connected to some of those core services for students. Obviously, some of those services, you provide more of them, the more students you have, and that's connected to the enrollment-driven piece. But there may be something that fits within that, that sort of base level, if you will, for, for just the, the um, beginning student-level support for those things that are outside just the core academics as you're mentioning several other things, but about the entirety of life as a student and, and going forward to be successful. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, with a few minutes left in this session, we've got Governor Smith, then Representative Briggs. Thank you. Um, well, Scott, I can't wait till you catch on to what we're doing a little bit here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, that's, an, that's an absolute compliment. I think your, your grasp of things is stunning to me. Um, just to give you a little feedback on a couple of things you mentioned, um, the fixed cost and the last one you had about the mixed mission, like a school or whatever might have a mixed mission, different mission. Um, I think I would give some consideration to whether or not that doesn't undermine the student enrollment component. And my gut reaction is that has to be embedded into my cost of operation. So if I'm delivering an education to these students under the enrollment component, I have to figure out how to manage my fixed costs. And does it open up just a, you know, okay, how many buildings do you have? How much square feet do you have? Do you have a parking garage? Do you have parking lots? I mean, like, I don't know. Uh, you, you know, maybe you have a transportation system that you're dealing with too. I don't know. It just seems to me like it gets unending and you already have kind of a another area that could be unending when you're talking about the enrollment thing and these components like you were talking to Senator Martin about. So my gut says they mix, they, they just add more variables, like stay focused on the student side of this and let all of us as individual institutions be more responsible in terms of like, do I really need this facility, which is part of my fixed cost? And, and over time, we would then be more, you know, addressing to those things. Um, 
on the actual formulaic part of it, I think what Representative Roy said makes a lot of sense. And, and I don't know exactly how that would comport to this, you know, what they did there to what you're doing here. But I do know that I don't want to be pessimistic, but anytime you start doing formulas, you know, it's one of those things they're, they might sound great. They might be morally and professionally and statistically perfect. When you drive the money out, if if a university is shocked, it, that was the word Brad used, and I, I think that was the right word. If it changes things into a level of shock, then we know the political realities. We've been down this road before. The, the the forces come into play, and things start to get tampered with, and then the perfection of your formula gets blown up. So we're here, so we got here. Let's face it. I mean, let's be honest. So um, I think you do have to figure out some way to mitigate the shock value or the potential shock to a system. Uh, my last comment, um, and I, 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 I'm going to boil it down to just a couple categories of our, our workforce development obligation that Dan has, you know, been kind of centerpiece, you know, talking about has made it a big part, like, where are we with fulfilling our mission to Pennsylvania to, to you have students fill these workforce development demands that exist. And then our sort of uh, moral obligation to address social mobility to, you know, underrepresented minorities, whatever, however you want to categories like that, out of balance. I think we have to really look at a balance there of, and, and I actually would equate to, I think we have just as much moral obligation to lift these this group of people up who haven't had an opportunity, as much as we have a, a moral obligation to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to fulfill the workforce thing. I mean, not that they're absolutely equal, but, but, but I think they're on this, we have to think of them in the same category in a way. Um, and so we have to be mindful of where, the, where the value added is in this um, bang for the buck kind of thing. Um, I don't want to use another basic education analogy, but I probably could. When, when it was probably back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, special education costs were just going off the charts because they had just exercised all the new laws and the, and the new strength and, and all, and it just it got out of whack. And at some point it was a zero sum game. I mean, you had X number of dollars for education, for basic education, and you could spend it all with this group. You could spend it all with that group and whatever you did, you might've been ignoring the, what I kind of always just generally made up as like sort of the 70% in the middle who really are what most of us are, you know, just your average, you know, we're, you know, we're the average people that kind of make the world go around in our communities. And we're the people that are part of our, you know, the hospital board or your chamber board or your churches or your little league or your volunteer fire, you know, we have, you know, kind of the middle. And uh, so we have to keep that in balance as you, I think you, as you, as you measure it up, but my, my gut overall reaction is make your best stab at staying within the, the student driven components and how to try to, Bill, I take what Bill said pretty, that was an interesting observation. I think that, that, that you know, if you have a, a first generation student that there's an extra cost to do that and that you shouldn't be penalized for it as you would, you might characterize that as you are today, you should be compensated for doing it. So I, I think that's a really good perspective that can be applied to many of those groups. Uh, Secretary uh, Garcia kind of, met, you know, I think it's, I think it, I think it's agreeing with what what she was sort of talking about too, uh, as you identify the groups that each of you have that maybe all of you don't have, you know. So, thank you very much for your consideration and your hard work. Thank, thank, thank you, Governor Smith. And I, I, I will point out that I'm not a mathematician who cares about perfect formulas, but I'm an engineer who cares about results that work. So personally, I, I agree with you that we need to avoid that. And, um, but I'm taking up time we don't have, so sorry, Randy. Uh, Representative Briggs and then Secretary Jones. 
Great, thanks. And, and this is awesome, an awesome conversation and and uh, it's it really is coming together nice. I, I, I'm i kind of with the speaker that I, I think we should less emphasize the fixed costs. I mean, if there is gonna be a fixed cost, it should be really um, limited, I think. I think we should be emphasizing more on on enrollment. Um, and just real quick, you, you answered, you asked, a couple of questions about that, so I, I would I would not go in that direction. And then, what kind of uh, targets we should have? I, I think it's the, you know, the, the BIPOC community or the uh, first generation students. You know, are are students who are going to need a little bit extra help um, to to make them successful. If there's a way to kind of add on a kicker, like if they finish in four years or five years, that should be acknowledged, um, you know, as a result. And then also. Um, kind of targeted professions, as as the secretary said, if it's nursing or teachers or something that is clearly a target for our Commonwealth to to try to satisfy that that shortfall. Um, you know, I know nursing healthcare costs a little bit more to educate than than other professions. Um, so that 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 would be an idea. I was writing these things down, um, and then I just did have a question about um, you, you had mentioned. Uh, urban versus rural, and there's a, a context, and there's a differential. I, I have an opinion on that. Um, what could you? I don't want to assume anything. What would is, is it? Which way does that play out? Um, it, it, there are a number of opinions among work group members on that point because you can imagine that it plays out in multiple ways on different cost structures and different opportunities. And so, so I, I hesitate to give a specific answer okay. because it really is, we I recognize there's a difference Workforce there. seems to be pretty set, right? Like yeah. it's a union contract statewide. So that's, I, I think it's, I, you know, living in a more urban or um, urban area, it's our cost of living is higher mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, but that's not something that can be changed by uh, the formula that that's, statewide all, all of us have mentioned all of those things and a few others and it really is just a recognition that they exist and it would not be simple to obviously we can't change them but do we do something in response to them i guess is what i would say but but we have not settled on it should okay. be this that we thought we should mention that as an example given the various places our universities are at thank you i, I don't want to assume but I, I i appreciate that answer thank you thank you chair excuse me may i just add one other thought uh while this is in the public session, and it's pretty transparent, and it's a you know pretty robust discussion about this, uh, not very many people are paying attention to it. So we also need to think, believe it or not, not the whole world isn't watching. Um, so we need to think about how we communicate as you step forward, so that not only do we want to avoid shocking a particular school because the formula you know changed things dramatically in that purest sense. We also have to not shock people and not be able to help them understand whatever the logic and mathematics and engineering that goes into this. We need to think about the communication aspect to others. Yeah, I think that's a great comment. We needed to think about the communication aspect to the presidents, to the CFOs, the CAOs, and the board as well. The, the work group has perfect ideas, fully formed. It's just a matter of explaining them to everyone. Not, not, <laughs> not, that was a joke, but, but it really is, it, as we talk about it, we're learning what we need to, to explain more clearly and make folks aware of just within the business, if you will, with all of you and, and our colleagues. And so taking it in a broader audience requires even more attention. I, I read my scribble, so I, I, I apologize. I'm gonna uh, jump in front of Secretary Jones again. But um, I mean, I did wanna uh, thank the, uh, Mike for mentioning what we did last year when we kind of try to blend using the one-time funds to, to soften this shock. I mean, I, I think it'll uh, um, be, it will be a transition into this and uh, I, I do think that'll help. And Senator Martin mentioned um, our veterans. I, I think I would like to add that as a, uh, as a potential um, in, you know, community that we could be offering assistance, extra services to. Thank you. Thank you. Secretary Jones, and then the last person on my list will be uh, Governor Moskowitz. Secretary Jones. Try to be quick. I did have one question. Um, can you remind us on average, how much of the formula makes up the overall university uh, funding sources so that we have a context around how much we're talking about there? Um, yeah, and again, I'll remind everyone that this is the education and general component, not the K 
capital and other things. If you take out some of the, the other revenue sources for the universities, which are biased heavily by the ARP funding, and so we need to pull those out in the immediate sense, it's about 30% of the total um, revenue budgets on the education in general for the universities comes from that appropriation. Most, almost all, really, really, really close to all of the rest comes from the tuition and fees that our students pay. And that is a like enrollment driven. Um, in and of itself course. is enrollment yeah. driven, exactly. Um, thank you for that. I just wanted to kind of add um, that my instinct was really similar to um, Secretary Smith and Representative Briggs around the, the mission driven piece mainly because I think as a board, you know, the uniqueness of each university having a focus on a mission is really noble, but it's hard for us, I think, to, to decide which ones are, you know, most important um, in this kind of context. And so my instinct was really um, focusing on things as a board or as a system we have shared goals around. Um, and as far as like the student population piece, you know, from my perspective, I, I like that we're moving in this direction and kind of aligning the money with our, where our mouth is around um, student success. I think that um, it would be really great. And, and without like, you know, some student populations have already been mentioned. I think they're all good. Just really focusing on kind of like to the slides that Kate provided earlier around like where our opportunity um, student populations are so that, you know, we can probably start identifying them to grow our enrollments and kind of close that gap from like where we are and where we want to be, whether that's 100,000 or whatever. And they're, they probably are, you know, low income um, students of color, Pell, Pell students, community college transfer students, like all these um, folks that we've already mentioned, but just making sure there's alignment there with around the, the student success measures that we've approved and then kind of those very specific populations. Now I recognize it probably depends on the university. So that point is well taken around um, how you guys are all uniquely um, seeking different types of students. That's my two cents there. Great, thanks. Thank you very much. Lots of good thought there. All right. Uh, last in the queue is Governor Moskowitz. Hello. Thank you, President Triscoll. This was a, a really great presentation and I admire the group for uh, thinking creatively about how to help our students and help our system grow. Um, I personally, I agree with some of the comments that have been shared about the fixed costs. I, I agree. I don't think we should money up the water. Um, we need to focus on getting these students through. And uh, I would just talk about the uh, incentivizing groups. I think it's a, it's a great way of looking at it. And I was wondering if you've considered groups uh, that would also help the economy of Pennsylvania, such as additional funds for those that need labs like nursing and other things like that, which we need uh, so desperately those professions, uh, but things that cost more in general uh, to educate those people. And I, and I just wanted to add in, and, and it may be in your categories, but not specifically, is that we have a growing homeless population at our universities. And uh, is that uh, a consideration? But thank you for um, all the good work. Thank you. thank you. And I, I will say that I don't recall mentioning homeless specifically in the in the report, which lists a lot of other possibilities, but we'll add that to our consideration. It certainly fits within that framework. Um, we, we did have a discussion about the idea of high cost programs, um, such as nursing, you mentioned, wherever that might be to offer. And one of the things that, that um, a conclusion that we reached is that right now the institutions do have an opportunity to um, set differential tuition rates with the board's approval, of course, under the flexibility that's been in place that wasn't in place with the 2014 formula. And so we were thinking we would not be including that, but, but certainly we're listening now without question um, as a direct item. Um, and, and also, quite honestly, we talked about the fact that for some high priority uh, workforce areas that the state may need, this would be an opportunity for some targeted investment of additional appropriation above and beyond the base to hit some of the policy goals that the, the Commonwealth may set for, for itself and for us. So those are our discussions there. But again, we're listening today, and, and I, I, that comment has come up in some other conversations besides, besides yours. Um, Governor Moskowitz, so thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much. This has been uh, an excellent, excellent discussion, exactly what we hoped would happen. Uh, and there will be opportunities for uh, to continue this discussion, uh, you know, before we get to the point of actually approving um, an allocation formula recommendation. So let me move on. Um, we are behind, we were supposed to end at noon, uh, but we have two more items to complete. Uh, one is a, uh, an update um, on the university integrations. And for that, I will uh, turn it over to uh, Dale and Bashar, uh, our, our two presidents um, of integrating sets of universities for a brief update. And by the way, there's more information uh, that we can all go to um, uh, on our uh, uh, website. It, it goes to the General Assembly every quarter. Bashar has passed uh, the baton to me, so I'm going to go first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the Western integration, of course, most of you by now know that we have selected a name, Penn West University. And we're excited to move forward with our, our branding and our logos. Our curriculum array has been selected. It is in the process of being finalized and revised, but it's at this point, it's pretty solid. Our faculty and staff have been working diligently to realign the IT, the banner, slate, and all the other uh, back, the back uh, support systems. We are less than, we are fewer than five months from launch. And I must say um, the faculty and staff and the students have, have given us considerable input, lots of hard work, and they are moving in a very good direction. So we're on track with everything and are hitting our tier one, tier two, <laughs> the deliverables and moving towards the, the launch in the final phase. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the integration of Bloomsburg um, <clears throat> Lock Haven and Mansfield is also on track. Um, I want to start by sharing some thoughts about uh, the great work that the faculty and staff have been doing. I think you all recognize this is exhausting work. Uh, it's taking three unique cultures and melding them into a single culture with a laser focus on our students and their success. Um, in the Northeast, the university cabinet has been dissecting the student experience from prospects to graduation. And we're really looking at best practices within the triad, but also looking at high impact and best practices nationally. Uh, and I'm delighted to say we're, see, we're already beginning to see the results. Um, Lock Haven University built and launched the Student Success Center in three months. And the students have been remarkably receptive of that entity. Um, as far as the curriculum for the new unified university, comparable to the West, our academic colleges have been named. Uh, the deans of all the colleges have been identified with the exception of two, and we will be not launching national searches for uh, the dean of the College of Health Profession Professions and the dean of the School of Nursing. Uh, we did not have any incumbents within the triad uh, to uh, rise to the level of filling those positions. Um, I'm sure you're all wondering about a name. Uh, we continue to do our due diligence in brand equity and brand strength. And within the next two to three weeks, we will come forward to the chancellor with a recommendation. Uh, this is one of the most difficult parts of this, of this endeavor. No decision we make will make all stakeholders happy. But I will say this to you, we are laser focused on prospective students and their families to make sure that we do not alienate the most important stakeholders that will ultimately enroll at our unified university. Happy to take any questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. I believe uh, Representative Roy's hand is up uh, and we're, we're gonna make this session brief, but please go ahead, Representative oh, Roy. Oh, thank you. Y yeah, I, I wanted to ask about, about the name. You know, the name in the West was done about three months ago. And I was just curious what the timeline was with July 1st, is you know just five months away and it just really seems like it, it should have a name so I, I really hope that one is established you know in the next you know very 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 near future it seems like it'd be easier to recruit students if you could tell them what the name of the school is and uh hopefully that can get resolved soon thank you thank you uh representative roy uh, actually we planned this uh, very strategically 
uh, because we are recruiting for the three independent unique universities for the fall 22 class. And we did not wanna go out there and confuse the marketplace with a name that will not impact recruitment until the fall 23 class. So uh, I appreciate your comments, but this was very strategically uh, placed in the timeline in partnership with our marketing and brand research firm. Thank you so much. And if I could add, um, the uh, circumstances in the West were very different than in the Northeast. The West was uh, is launching um, online, which is a blend, and which which needed its own brand. And so um, the the West prioritized name and brand. Uh, uh, because it needed to and 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 move forward, and that's very exciting. And it, to to President Hanna's point, the Northeast does did not need to. Um, so uh, and 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 it, there's a general point, I guess, which is worth make, uh, making is that we are seeing sort of um, a diff we were very much in lockstep as we were in the planning phase and preparing plans for the board. But now each of the plans is being into implemented in ways that meet local circumstances and and pri priorities, which do differ. So. This is one area and there are certainly others. Great. Thank you so much. And, and uh, uh, Dale and Bashar, thank you so much for the uh, amazing work that you are doing. Um, it, it's so appreciated. Uh, and, um, you know, I just hope you're getting some rest occasionally. I don't know what to say. <laughs> but we're all thinking about you and we all so appreciate it. Okay, we're going to move to the last item on our agenda, which is a, um, it's a happy one, but a sad one. Uh, it's my honor to welcome back our former board member, uh, Stephen Washington, because we want to honor his service uh, with a resolution. Uh, Stephen, of course, is one of our student board members who graduated from SHIP in December. So for that, congratulations. Yay. So proud of you. And we're so glad that you're able to join us on Zoom today. Um, so I am going to uh, read a resolution in your honor uh, and um, then we'll see what happens after that. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas Stephen Washington began his service to Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education when he joined the Board of Governors as a student member in July, 2020, and whereas Stephen's remarkable career as a student at Chippensburg University of Pennsylvania includes serving as president of the Student Government Association and as a student trustee of the university, and whereas Stephen served as a peer leader at Chippensburg, creating and leading programs to support students in tangible ways and serves as a resident assistant, assistant in the ROTC living learning community, and whereas Stephen graduated from Chippensburg with a bachelor's degree of science and business and administration, MIS, with a military science minor. Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Governors proudly recognizes the accomplishments and contributions of Stephen Washington, celebrates his success, and wishes him nothing but the best in the next chapter of his life. And by voice acclamation and maybe Zoom thumbs up, <laughs> I move approval of this resolution. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Yeah, thank you for the thumbs too. I appreciate Aye. that. Uh, you, you know, Stephen, I'm going to uh, uh, turn this over to you. But first, um, uh, to President Patterson at SHIP, uh, and I, I just want to say that uh, I, I thought you were extraordinary. Um, I quite forgot, you know, that you were a student, um, <laughs> and and that only means because you're so wise. Uh, and uh, so mature, um, and you know, you were involved during some of the most uh, challenging um, yet, you know, opportunity-producing, I guess, uh, conversations and meetings um, of of this board. Okay. Uh, you you really you landed here on the board, you know, right right during the exciting time, um, and. Uh, you always provided uh, just uh, the, the kind of perspective that influenced people in, in, a, in the best way possible. So uh, I just want you to know how much I note that and appreciate that. Um, so thank you. And uh, uh, Charles, do you wanna say a few words? 
Yes, thank you, Chairwoman Shapira. And you're right, I came to know um, Stephen Washington when I was then president of Mansfield. And I've come to know Stephen as a student and as a leader on our campus. Um, and a recent graduate, of course, of Shippensburg University. In addition to serving on the Board of Governors, Stephen served as a trustee and as a uh, president of our Student Government Association, a member of the President's Advisory Board, which is called the Watchkeepers, and a founder of the Lighthouse Academy, which is our first student-led leadership and professional development organization. Stephen is a, really a shining example of what it means to be a student leader in PASHE and known for his unwavering positive attitude and his ability to motivate others. His leadership profile has really become a pretty high bar to which other emerging leaders on campus tend to compare themselves, despite my continued counsel that such comparisons are not in the best interest of our students and really akin to trying to challenge Usain Bolt to a, a jog around the block. And uh, you simply aren't going to outpace this man. Um, he will outrun you every time. And while the pandemic largely disrupted the face-to-face -face interactions of Stephen and the other board members, uh, he continued to be an active member and a contributor to the board throughout his service and has dedicated himself to all PASHE students. So thank you, Stephen, for your selfless leadership, <clears throat> excuse me, and service to Shippensburg University and the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education, your energy, and your steadfast enthusiasm will be greatly missed. Thank you. Stephen, would you like to say a few words? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Chairwoman. <laughs> President Patterson, thank you. Thank you for the, the kind remarks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Chairwoman Shapira, uh, governors, Chancellor Greenstein, presidents, thank you. You know, as, as it was shared, I joined the board at a very, very unique time. Um, March of 2020, the world as we know it changed. And as a result, uh, there were many, many uh, new challenges that not only our system faced, but the world faced. In addition to the challenges that, that we were working on in, in, in really, you know, creating a brand new system for so many to flourish, you know, we still had the obligation to fulfill the dreams of so many students to obtain a level of higher education. And so with this came very, very challenging decisions, long discussions, conversations, um, and ultimately pointing us in the direction that would get us to our mission. And because of this, we needed strong leadership, which this board Chair, Chairwoman Shapira, Chancellor Greenstein have demonstrated so well. And I can assure the public that there is no easy button sitting in the Chancellor's office for him to press and have the perfect solution presented at any time for any situation. You know, although actually that, that might be pretty cool. Uh, so Chancellor Greenstein, we get some engineering students on that. Uh, that would be great. <laughs> but speaking of our students, we have some truly amazing students here in our system. And three of them are serving as current Board of Governors members, which they will do such a phenomenal job at advocating and speaking for the voices of so many students in the system. And lastly, I would like to really thank not only the board, but the students. It was an absolute pleasure to be able to represent, serve, and be a great help to my fellow students. And I wish every single one of them the best of luck and I'm rooting for them every step of the way. So governors, presidents, thank you. And it's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you again, Stephen. And I, I just want you to know, uh, please never be a stranger and we will be following your career with great expectation. Um, okay, I think we are uh, ready to close unless there are any other matters to come before the board. No, Randy's shaking his head no. Okay, uh, hearing none, uh, thank you very, very much. Terrific meeting um, and we are now adjourned. Everyone drive safely. Bye.